All right, good morning. I would like to welcome everyone here today. My name is Rafael Salamanca. I am the council member for the 17th Council District, of which I serve as a chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to welcome my colleagues who are members of the committee and who are joining us today. I would like to um, welcome Council Member Kuhl, Lansman, Gradenchik, Chair Adams, and Council Member Diaz. I want to thank Council Member Moya, Kalos, and Adams for their leadership and work in, with the zonings, landmarks, and planning subcommittees. This hearing is going to be held jointly with Technology Committee, and I welcome Chair Kuhl and members of the committee who will be joining later on when we do our oversight over the Department of in Information Technology and, Te and Telecommunications. This hearing will cover the fiscal 2019 pre preliminary budget for the Landmarks Preservation Commission, the Department of City Planning, and Do It. Chair Ku will speak to some of the issues regarding Do It at 11.30 a.m. I want to remind everyone that if you would like to testify, please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant of Arms. We're going to begin this hearing with testimony from the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and the Landmarks Subcommittee is chaired by, uh, by Chair Adrian Adams. I want to thank Chair Adams for her work on these issues. The Landmark Preservation Commission designates, regulates, and protects New York City's art, historic and cultural resources. LPC's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget totals $6.7 million. The department's fiscal 2019 prelim preliminary budget is $456,000, or nearly 7.5% more than the fiscal 2018 adopted budget of $6.3 million. We would like to thank Chair Srinivasan, I'm sorry if I messed that up, <laughs> for, the, for joining us today. Before we hear from the chair, I would uh, turn over to Councilmember Adams for her opening remarks. Good morning. My name is Adrienne Adams, and uh, first, I would like to thank Chair Salamanca and the members of the committee for holding this hearing today. Today, we will hear from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to discuss the agency's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget, which totals $6.7 million. As such, we will review LPC's budgetary actions included in the pre preliminary plan, as well as any current or proposed modifications to agency operations. LPC is entrusted with the responsibility to preserve our collective history in New York City through the landmark designation process. Landmark designation is an honor that the city imparts to exemplary buildings that capture a unique moment in the history of our city. However, the landmark process can be controversial. Property owners of designated landmarks face uncertainty about future costs for maintaining landmark buildings. They ask, how much will this landmark status cost for upkeep of their property? and what resources are available to them to help pay for that maintenance. LPC has also proposed several new rules which introduce more uncertainty into the landmark designation process, who is responsible for determining alterations to buildings, and how will these decisions be determined. The landmark process can also be controversial by the stories that these landmarks tell about our city whose story is being told through our landmark designations, and who decides what story should be told by our landmarks. Today's hearing is about transparency, and we hope the public will have answers to some of these questions before we're finished here today. Thank you, Chair Srinivasan, for being here today to answer our questions. I will hand it over to you now to read your testimony. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair Salamanca and Chair Adams and members of the Land Use Committee. I'm Inakshi Srinivasan, Chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Today, I'm joined by Sarah Carroll, our Executive Director, Gardia Gaphardt, our Budget Director, and Ali Razuli Najad, our Director of Community and uh, Intergovernmental Affairs. The Landmarks Commission, which is the mayoral agency responsible for protecting and preserving New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites, has been at the forefront of preservation policy and a model for many municipalities all over the country. The preservation of historic resources provides enormous public benefits and contributes to the vitality of the city and is in part what makes New York a dynamic global destination. I'm excited to be here before a new Land Use Committee, and thank you for inviting me to testify about the Commission and its fiscal year 2019 budget. 
I'd like to start by outlining the preliminary budget and then give you an overview of our achievements over the last term and highlight some of our new initiatives. The LPC's adopted budget for fiscal year 2018 was 6.26 million, and for fiscal year 2019, the preliminary budget is 6.74 million, which comprises 6.15 million in city funds and 596,000 in federal community development block grant funds. Of the overall preliminary budget, 87% is allocated to personnel services and 13% is allocated to other than personnel services. Our budget supports agency departments, including the research department, responsible for evaluating and advancing properties for designation, the preservation department that reviews permit applications for work on designated properties, the enforcement department that investigates complaints of potential violations and helps owners correct non-compliances, and the Archaeology and Environmental Review Departments that assist city, state, and federal agencies for the environmental review process. The agency's total headcount of the preliminary fiscal year 2019 budget is 85, including 77 full-time positions and eight part-time positions. This is an increase of four full-time positions above the current headcount of 81, which includes 73 full-time positions and eight part-time positions. There are currently a total of 77 staff members, including 71 full-time and six part-time positions. We're in the process now of filling the remaining positions. The increase in our budget of 456,000 includes funding for four new full-time positions, as well as provides us 240,000 in one-time funding for the agency's relocation from the municipal building at 1 Center Street to 253 Broadway. Of the CDBG funding, about 80% is allocated to personnel supporting critical community development related functions such as surveys, environmental review, archaeology, community outreach, and education, while about 20% or approximately 115,000 is allocated for a historic preservation grant program for low-income homeowners and not-for-profit organizations. The LPC designated and regulates more than 36,000 buildings in all five boroughs including 1,408 individual landmarks, 120 interior landmarks, 10 scenic landmarks, and 141 historic districts and extensions. We also receive close to 14,000 applications annually for work on these designated properties. Under my tenure, the Commission has taken a multi-pronged approach to ensure good government practices and to promote equity, diversity, efficiency, and transparency in all aspects of our work. I am proud that from 2014 to 2018, with the help of our research department, the Commission extended landmark status to 3,861 buildings and sites across the five boroughs, including 63 individual landmarks, two interior landmarks, and 10 historic districts. This is the second highest total for an administration in its first term since 1974. The majority of these properties are within historic districts, extending protections to 3,771 buildings and sites that reflect New York's diverse neighborhoods. These include the Central Ridgewood, Crown Heights North, Bedford Historic Districts, and the Mount Morris Park Historic District Extension. We're also pleased that the agency has no backlog of calendars properties for designation. We commenced a highly public 18-month process in 2015 to address items that had been on the Commission's calendar for decades some since 1966. This initiative led to the designation of 26 stellar buildings and structures by the end of 2016 and the IRT powerhouse in 2017. These designations represent all five boroughs and celebrate a diverse array of architectural styles, time periods, building typologies, and historical significance. Throughout the last four years, we have also worked closely with the Department of City Planning to evaluate historic preservation opportunities in neighborhoods undergoing rezoning or neighborhood plans. As a result, we designated 12 buildings in East Midtown and the Empire Dairy Complex, which includes five buildings in East New York. The Commission is also considering designations in East, Har uh, uh, in East Harlem. We have four properties under consideration. Uh, and in the past week, we also calendared two properties in the Far Rockaways. Both these neighborhoods have been recently rezoned. We're currently working with city planning to evaluate historic resources in Gowanus, Bushwick, and Inwood. In 2017, 
Fiscal year 2017, we designated 26 individual landmarks to interiors and to historic districts for a total of 319 buildings and sites. Thus far in fiscal year 2018, we have designated 11 individual landmarks and one interior landmark, including Old St. James Church in Elmhurst, the IRT Powerhouse on the west side of Manhattan, and the interiors of the New York Public Library at 42nd Street. We have also calendared nine additional buildings, one interior and two historic districts, including Boreham Hill Historic District Extension and Central Harlem, 130th to 132nd Street in Upper Manhattan. I'm excited to let you know that on March 20th, we will bring before the Commission our recommendation to calendar the Coney Island Boardwalk as a scenic landmark. I will now turn to our Preservation Department, which is the largest department within the agency and which helps owners of designated buildings to navigate the permit process to restore, alter, and rehabilitate their buildings. The staff issues approximately 94 to 97% of the permits administratively, pursuant to the Commission's rules and they present approximately 3 to 6% of the applications to the full commission each year. In fiscal year 2017, the commission received 13,874 permit applications and took action on 13,556 applications during the same period. To February of this year, we received, um, in this fiscal year, we received 8,786 applications and have taken action on 79, 1,029 applications. The number of, uh, yeah, 7,929 applications, excuse me. The number of applications received last fiscal year reflects about 16.6% increase over the number of applications the LPs received in four years earlier in fiscal year 13. Our permit reviewer headcount has increased by 33% in the same period. This has allowed us to continue to issue permits efficiently and provide support for those seeking to make changes, whether they're large property owners, small business, or homeowners. In 2017, we also launched an internal tracking system that is time sensitive to make the review of applications much more accountable. In order to improve our regulatory functions even further, we have commenced the CAPA process, which the city wide administrative process act for proposed amendments to our agency rules that will update standards and codify well-established commission policies and staff practices for ministerial staff level approvals. Over the past year, we have con conducted significant outreach to preservation advocates, property owners and industry groups, and a public hearing will be scheduled for March 27th. We believe that these amendments will create a more streamlined process for permits, will make our regulatory procedures much more efficient and cost effective, and will provide more transparency for property owners, community residents, and others in your districts. The Commission also implements a modest historic preservation grant program targeted for low and moderate income homeowners and not-for-profit organizations to help restore or repair the facades of their landmark buildings. In fiscal year 2018, the program was award, has awarded three grants, one residential grant in the Prospect Park South Historic District in Brooklyn, and two non-for-profit grants, including the Rene and Haim Gross Foundation in South Village Historic District, and the Henry Street Settlement and Individual Landmark on the Lower East Side. We're also currently speaking with OMB and HUD to clarify the types of projects at religious properties that may qualify for a grant program, and thanks to the urging of Chair Salamanca. Over the past four years, we've had made great strides in harnessing technology and our website to achieve our goal to provide more transparency and accessibility to the Commission's work. Regarding our research and designation work, since 2014, all designation reports have been made available online. In 2016, we launched an interactive landmarks web map, Discover NYC Landmarks, that provides an intuitive and interactive tool to access information regarding our designations. Last year, we launched the Historic Building Data Project in which we transferred information from 50 years of designation reports into a geographic information system database. In December 2017, we enhanced our landmarks web map with building by building data on all buildings within historic districts and searchable information on the approximately 36,000 buildings and sites under the Commission's purview. We believe that this readily available information is invaluable to property owners, community groups, residents and members of the public. On a regulatory side, since 2015, we have made all commission level application presentations and commission decisions available online. Since 2016, a searchable online permit application database 
has also been made available, allowing print interested parties to view the status of LPC applications and issued permits, including staff level approvals. In 2016, the Commission also launched a digital archive dedicated to our robust archaeological collections, making New York City the first municipality to host such digital archives. And within the past year, we unveiled an interactive story map to celebrate the centennial of women's suffrage in New York, and we had previously in launched an interactive map on the LGBT historic designations. I will end by just saying how honored I am to lead this agency. It is a tremendous privilege to be trusted with the Commission's mandate to preserve New York's heritage for us and future generations. Thank you again for allowing me to testify, and I'm happy to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to recognize we've been joined by Chair Moya. Um, just for the panel, we've, we, uh, we would like to swear you in, so the council will, will swear you in. Okay. Please state your names. Meenakshi Srinivasan. Sarah Carroll. Gardia Kepart. <coughs> Ali Rasulinajad. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you will give today and the testimony you've just given will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will respond to all questions truthfully as well? I do. I do. We do. All right. Well, thank you very much. So I want to just uh, touch base a little bit in terms of your, your new rules and your proposed amendments. Um, can you speak a little bit about what they are very deep, well, not too detailed, but you know, point them out and how, how is that process going to work? I know that there is a, uh, a proposed uh, hearing that you're going to have on March 28th. Uh, yes. yes, I'm sorry, the 27th, uh, regarding these uh, proposed changes. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. Uh, agencies adopt rules that um, codifies their policies and practices. It is uh, seen as a very transparent way of showing everyone what the Commission does. We have an extensive body of rules uh, that essentially uh, explains what type of applications come before uh, are, that are approved at staff level versus what comes before the commission. And uh, at this point, about 93 to 96 percent of the applications are approved at staff level. Uh, we've been working on this rules initiative uh, over the past several years to find ways to continue to streamline our process and to allow for the regulatory process to uh, meet up with current and future demands. Um, so the broader goals of this initiative is really one of efficiency, of transparency, uh, allowing uh, uh, owners of, and stakeholders to um, go through a process which is uh, more streamlined and predictable, uh, and really to encourage uh, compliance with the law. And we believe overall uh, the goals of uh, our rules would also foster preservation in the future as well, and I can explain that a little further. So broadly speaking, uh, the rules do three things. The first is that it reorganizes our extensive body of rules uh, to be much more um, readable and intuitive. Uh, right now you have sections that are in different parts uh, of the document, and we're planning to consolidate them so that they are much more, uh, um, just much more comprehensive and understandable. So that's the first rule, which is a structural change. The second is that for 50 years, the staff has um, had the practice of approving uh, certain types of applications, and we see this as an opportunity to codify those rules um, um, uh, as a part of this proposal. And we believe that the codification of rules that are for staff level approvals that are current will make it much more clear and much more consistent. And so we believe that that really will be much more transparent, both for staff but also for, uh, for stakeholders, including uh, property owners themselves. They'll understand what they need to do, um, as well as um, preservation groups, community residents, and members of the public. The third thing that uh, our rules would do is that they would codify uh, what we've seen as um, consistent commission practice to approve certain types of applications, and those would be codified and delegated to staff. And if can, you I'm sorry, can you repeat that yeah. again? What's going to be delegated to staff? What's going to be delegated to staff are the types of applications that have come before the commission over the last you know, several years, in fact, a fairly long period of time, where the commission has consistently 
approved and established criteria for that adoption. So, so staff will be approving designation without it going to the no, commission? The, this, these are related to applications that come after the designation has taken place. So the designation process hasn't changed. This is really, uh, the rule changes are really for applications that come before the commission and are approved either by staff or by the commission. So it's really, yeah, it, it's application based. And, but, and the applicants are typically property owners who come before us. All right. Um, um, so with this, uh, these changes of rules, I see that you're going to significantly increase the workload of your staff members. Uh, so do you believe that in fiscal year 19, you have the adequate amount of staffing there, or are you planning on increasing your, your staffing? All right. I think of, you know, the number of applications we receive, which is roughly about 14,000, uh, and it'll increase yearly, roughly around 1.6% each year on an average, um, will remain the same. So with the rule changes, the number of applications we receive will be the same. What will change is the number of applications that go, that are uh, approved at staff will be greater and the number of applications uh, approved at the commission will be less. But one thing to note is our staff in our preservation department works on both sets of applications. So they work on the commission approvals as well. Uh, there's always an internal review to make sure that those applications are complete, and then they bring it before the commission and they coordinate ongoing public hearings as well. So as a result of our change, uh, what will happen is that uh, since the, the uh, staff level approvals tend to be much more streamlined and uh, timely, it will actually reduce some of the uh, work that the staff will do. So uh, generally speaking, you have staff level approvals that take somewhere about a month to, uh, to approve, and you have commission level approvals which take about three to six months. Uh, so there's a time saving factor, but also just a, a, a more streamlined process for staff level review as well. Um, and I just, yes, okay. okay. And so are there any measures that are being considered to ensure the transparency regarding how decisions are made through staff? So what happened was last year, we already um, created a database that's available uh, on our website, and you can search that so you can actually find applications that are approved at staff level. You can find out, well, you can find out how many have been filed, and you can also find out the status, whether it's under review and uh, then when it's approved as well. So that will be ongoing well. All right, I'm gonna hand it off to our chair, uh, Adams. She has more specific questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you again, uh, chair. I had some questions regarding uh, the grants and uh, the way that the grants are handled. Um, according to data provided by your agency to the council over the th past three fiscal years, Ten historic preservation grants were awarded to both homeowners and nonprofit organizations. The total amount of funding at adoption for fiscal year 2016 through 2018 um, were substantial amounts. I just want to know who approves the applications for the grants? Uh, we have staff uh, that approves, the, uh, that works on the grants, and then we have a board within uh, the Landmarks Commission who will finally award uh, the grants. So we have uh, people who are working on the application process, and then finally there's a board that will approve the grants. Okay, so a combination of the staff and then the board is the final? Yes. Final answer, okay. Um, we understand that grant applicants need to meet a number of criterion yes. for consideration. Uh, what is LPC doing? Um, or what is the amount of funding in your advertising budget to spread the word about the grant opportunity? All right, our grant is about $115,000 uh, annually, and um, there's several fronts. So we do a lot of outreach to encourage people to apply for the grant, uh, and our outreach includes during new designations when we're uh, we're, when we're talking to property owners and garnering support, we talk to them about the grant program. 
Uh, during the designation process, often we will go back out to communities and again explain what are, what are the responsibilities of landmarking and then what, is, uh, what are the various programs available for financial assistance, one being a grant program. Uh, and often once uh, historic districts are, particularly historic districts, when they're, um, when they're designated, we will go back to those communities. We also do targeted outreach. Um, I know that we did one in uh, Longwood uh, Historic District on the request of uh, Chair Salamanca, which we thought was very effective. And we've done several in Addisley Park, which was specific to really understanding the grant program. So the grant program comes from our CDBG funding, which has federal requirements to them. And they're basically for low and moderate income. Um, and they have other kinds of criteria associated with them. Uh, which is that the property must be owned by the person who is asking for the grant. Uh, in the case of a nonprofit, the nonprofit uh, should be a charitable organization, own the property, and the charitable organization, scientific, educational, or literary. Um, so that should be the bailiwick. Although I just want to point out we are exploring with HUD about um, the grants and its eligibility to religious properties as well. So that's an ongoing uh, piece of work that we're doing. Uh, the other criteria that we have includes looking at the building itself, um, the type of work, um, uh, whether it's restorative in nature, and, uh, and just the impact of the grant itself on both the existing building, the surrounding buildings if it's in a historic district, and the, uh, and, and the impact uh, within the historic <laughs> district overall. Uh, so our grants are typically for restorative work, and they run the gamut. They, um, you know, you could do stoop repair, you could do repointing and and uh, remodeling on the facades. Uh, you could do uh, replacement um, and um, upgrading of windows uh, and repair of other historic features like cornices, sills, and lintels. Um, so those are the kind of things that uh, come before us. And um, I think those are the points I wanted to make. Okay, the, so the scope is very, very broad. Right. Um, and just one more thing, I think our grants roughly run between, uh, you know, ten to uh, thirty thousand dollars per grant. Uh, part of that is to uh, uh, sort of allow for, an, uh, you know, spread spread that uh, those dollars to more people, um, and uh, so that's uh, I think where we get the numbers, which is about for four grants, three grants, and three grants over the last three years. That was my next question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also want to know how many applications uh, are submitted for historic preservation grants? Okay, well, it's, it's very sort of interesting. In the last uh, two years, we received 20 applications, out of which only seven were really eligible for the grant. Under HUD. Under HUD, uh, under the criteria. So, uh, the other were unfortunately did not qualify because either they didn't meet the, mostly because they did not meet the income levels that was required, or they didn't own the property. Um, so, and then over, let's say, the last uh, five years, we received about 60 applications, and 24 of them were um, eligible for the grant, and we granted about, uh, we granted 18 projects. And so over the last five years, we've dispensed about, you know, somewhere about $450,000 for various grants. Okay, and the average, uh, I think you just answered it, but the average uh, grant amount requested? Right, it's, uh, we usually give roughly ten dollars to $30,000. Uh, in some years, we've given more than that. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, it was about uh, forty-nine, fifty thousand. dollars uh, It varies, but it's th that's roughly, I would say, on an average. Okay. Um, I just have the, a couple more. Uh, with the understanding that each landmarks is unique, has LPC conducted any surveys of the cost of maintenance required to maintain good standing with LPC? Um, well, have we done surveys? I think what we've seen is uh, through our application process is that many people come to us. You know, when we think about the uh, 14,000 applications that they come before the commission and the fact that about 63 to 60 seven percent is approved at staff level. Those are really applications that are for maintenance and restoration work. So I think that speaks to the fact that many homeowners are very, very interested in the upkeep of their property. 
we see actually a very small amount of properties that really let their buildings go into disrepair, and we have another process that deals with it. So, uh, you know, I, I think I can confidently say a majority of property owners really keep their buildings in well, in, uh, you know, in, in good condition uh, under the landmarks law, and um, these there are these few and far between up situations, uh, and those we will. Uh, pursue another action to try and get uh, owners to keep up their properties. Yeah, they keep the right. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So, the other thing is just uh, in terms of uh, the cost of maintaining, and it's, it's sort of an interesting question. The first thing is that we don't compel property owners to do work uh, when you're designated. Uh, you're not required to go and restore your building if, if you have grandfathered features. It's really when applicants want, and owners want to come before the commission and they have a scope of work in mind. Then we will work with them on a couple of fronts. So we have technical expertise to guide owners and uh, explain to them what kind of work they can do and what are the best techniques of getting that work implemented. Um, we are sensitive to the issues of cost, and while strictly not, you know, it's not strictly within the landmarks law, but I think as an agency, we recognize that uh, our stakeholders uh, have, you know, different incomes and different backgrounds, and we're flexible about the kind of materials that they use, and we will guide them towards that. You know, we continue to have conversations with the industry on, let's say, substitute materials and what's acceptable. And so we have a pretty good you know, knowledge base in being able to, um, to really uh, to advise uh, homeowners uh, on work that they want to do. And finally, we, uh, we will refer them to different financial sort of sources, of, um, including our own grant program, but there are others that are offered by other non-for-profits, for example, uh, the New York um, Conservancy, so they, Landmarks Conservancy, they have several grants. They have grants for religious properties, which is separate, but they also have other grants for homeowners, um, and it's a loan program. And then there are tax credits that are, are available both at uh, the federal and state level, and we encourage um, owners to seek that as well. Okay. Do you feel that you are exhausting um, your resources to help uh, property owners to minimize uncertainty around costs of future maintenance? Um, have we exhausted? You know, there's always uh, room for improvement, and I think that uh, one of the things we are thinking, I mean, the rules really is one sort of way of, of uh, furthering that, that overall goal of making the regulatory burdens much less uh, burdensome, so to speak. And I think, I just on the rules, because I know uh, Chair Salamanca is very interested in many of the commissioners, and so council members may be interested, is that the type of work that we're talking about, which would uh, be delegated or is already done at stop and will be codified, is really everyday work that you see on properties everywhere. So if you think about those, uh, the type of work we're talking about, allowing for, you know, storefronts to have windows that can open, that you have you know, limited signage and awnings. Uh, there's uh, features which have to do with code upgrades and sustainability and, and, and resiliency. Um, uh, the other issues which is, even if it's for facade work, it's all restorative nature, but allowing for uh, different kinds of materials to essentially um, really meet the goal of preservation. So. Uh, the majority of the scope of uh, the rules is really about things that, uh, you know, in fact, sometimes we wonder why are these some things coming before the commission uh, when they're really very, you know, they're small in scope um, and we, you know, they're ubiquitous in nature and they haven't yet been codified as a rule. And so this is our opportunity to do that. And so we think that that scope of, of work under our rules is really, um, very much um, uh, in the same vein as I think some of the, the issues that you raised about uh, the burdens for, um, for people who own designated properties. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, just one more. I had a question uh, regarding your, um, your MMR and uh, PMMR uh, information. We've got some uh, indicators that don't have
yeah, that don't have targets associated mm -hmm. with them. Can you explain that? Okay, let's see. Let's look. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn it to uh, my executive director, Sarah. Okay. Sarah Carroll. Um, I think we are, we're happy to address specific ones if you have questions about them, but I think that ones that the indicators that um, calculate our performance, our, in other words, our timeliness or responsiveness, those have targets. The ones that track the number of letters the agency receives or the number of emails the agency receives, those, because those are coming from the outside, there's no target for the agency. It's, it's not necessarily a performance indicator. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Work with that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams. Can, I just have more questions in terms of that. Um, you're doing very well in terms of what your, the MMRs that we're getting here in terms of your four-month actuals. I mean, in fiscal year 18, for the last four months, letters responded within 14 days, 97%. Um, but I, I feel that you should still have a target that you, that you want to work out of. Um, and I, that's actually one of my recommendations uh, for your agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, how many letters and how many emails are you actually responding to? Because here it just says that you responded to 97% of them, but how, what's, what is 97%? I think it was, I think we get like thousands of emails and uh, I think we have those no, numbers, the, right? The number, the number yeah. of letters yeah. is fairly low. Okay, so the letters are different from the emails yeah. and uh, so the so, number, let's see. So, for ex so if you had um, 11 letters and we responded to 95. 11 letters and 11. we responded to 95% of them within 14 days, that would be, um, turning to our budget director who can do math very quickly. <laughs> 11 letters, 95%. So 85 are responded within the 14 days and 10 letters came afterwards. And how many emails? Okay, I, yeah, I think I'm uh, no, Okay. Uh, I think so, okay, so, for example, in um, and, and while you look for that information, you know, you're, we, this is one of the reasons that we're asking in terms of letters and emails. It's just good to know your workflow and the amount of workflow that you have. Uh, you know, one of the main purposes of your agency is to actually communicate with the community. Um, and tracking your communication, I think, is vital and key for us uh, when we're looking at staffing for your agency. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So just um, for, Jan uh, for just this past January, the agency received 483 emails. Okay, 98% is a very high mark. I mean, that's uh, something you should be very proud of. I'm gonna, I know uh, Chair Moya has some questions. After Chair Moya, we'll go to Council Member Gudenchik. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, and uh, thank you, Chairwoman, uh, for your time. I just have one quick question. Uh, on the old St. James, yes. um, is that, has that been done already? That's been designated, yes. Okay. That, that was my only question. I just, uh, also just want to know if we, ha we had support of the church. Uh, on, on yeah, no, no, that's because that's a it big... It has been. Right. It's, it's, yes, it's, yes, absolutely. It's beautiful. So, yeah. you know, it's the second, I think, second oldest uh, ecclesiastic building in Queens. It's yeah, really correct. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, Council Gretentric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair. It's good to see you. I know we don't get to see much of you, but uh, I'm all the way out in Eastern Queens. Um, my quick question, once a property is designated a landmark, does it, are there tax benefits that accrue to it, property tax benefits or sales tax benefits, or how does the city kind of compensate somebody? Right, there, are, there. My understanding, there's no tax benefits to it. Uh, it's only when you do work, you can sort of seek um, tax credits through either the state or federal programs that are in place. Okay. Um, okay. That that was it. Thank you very very much. Thank you. I um I have some questions. I know you may have 
answer them uh, with uh, Chair Adams. Um, it has to do with the, uh, the grants. How many within uh, fiscal year 16, 17, and 18, you were, uh, there were 10 grants that were awarded? How many applicants were there? So for... Okay. So in total, there were uh, 30 applications over the last three years. How many? 30. Three zero. 30. Okay. And the ones that are eligible? Uh, the ones that are eligible is uh, the... And there were 10 that are yeah. eligible, and we granted all 10 of them. And uh, one of them we granted, but they actually withdrew that application later on. So we had granted it to them, they withdrew the application. So, and are these applications like public facing accessible to the public? Are they accessible to the public? Yes. Yes, uh, God, you can't yes they are, our grant application uh, can be found on our website, um, on the Landmarks website, nyc.gov slash landmarks. We have both our nonprofit application and our uh, <coughs> homeowner application on our website. Yeah, so 30 applicants in, in three years. What was the criteria? Why were, this, why were some of these applicants turned down? Well, mostly it's because they didn't meet the income eligibility under the, the federal, under the HUD rules. Okay. And um, tell me a little bit about advertisement how, and outreach. How, how does your agency, you know, put this information out so that the city of New York or five boroughs knows that there's grants available for them? Right, so I think you know one thing we talked about uh, was the outreach that we do uh, to let either new owners of designated properties or uh, people within uh, in neighborhoods who've owned their property for a long time is to uh, go out and actually make presentations to them. Sometimes I've gone, and sometimes you know obviously the team has gone. So we do sort of face-to-face -face outreach with owners of properties as well as new. Uh, owners that are uh, that may have their properties designated, and I think that's where I kind of noted that we've gone out to Addisley Park twice, and we've gone out to Longwood. Um, we also have information on our website that's available. That's what uh, Guardia was talking about. We have pamphlets which we distribute and we mail, uh, so people can get that. Uh, we do e-blasts as well, and um, and I think the the other way that we get our grant program known is that. Uh, you know, the preservation community is very interested in uh, the use of grants, whether it's our grants or from the state and city or other nonprofits that provide it, because ultimately it's very good for preservation when buildings are able to uh, restore and upkeep uh, their buildings. So very often uh, our sort of what's it, orbit community uh, does a lot of referrals as well. So we refer our, when applicants come to us, we refer them to other, um, we tell them about our grant, but we also tell them about other grants. And similarly, we get referrals from other um, organizations. For example, the uh, New York Landmark Conservancy will refer people back to us also about the grants. Now, this, uh, these are grants. The, uh, the funding is coming from the federal government, am I right? So yes. what happens when, in a fiscal year, you don't use all of the funding that that grant has? Where, where does that money go? Uh, well, one thing, you know, but if, if, the, if the funds for the grants that we have been awarded are not dispersed because there's a timing issue, which is we award the grant, they, uh, it's put out to bid, we project manage uh, these grants in the process, um, so if there's money that is, uh, was uh, sort of earmarked for these grants and are not done during a fiscal year, then we work with OMB and they will roll over the funds uh, to the next year so the work can, can be completed in the next year. So in 2016, you utilized $71,713. Uh, so, and, and you got a total of 114,000, correct? Right. So yes. that, that funding was rolled over? It'll roll over if it's awarded already to a grant. Right. And what if it's not so, awarded? So, yes, there's sometimes situations where there'll be 
a certain amount that's kind of left on the table, so to speak, uh, and that will go into the general fund. Is that right? It's just it's so for 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 funding that is not spent. I mean, unfortunately, that's money that's left on the table. Uh, unfortunately, that's money that we're not able to we're not able to use. So only funding that's been earmarked to particular projects we are able to roll over. So, so the, the the funding that's not used just goes to the general fund. Just stays in, in the city the federal fund the general city fer, uh, federal fund. It goes back to the federal government. City, C yes, federal government. Yeah. So the city, so so it's it, like it, the city, right? with the city, but it's the city CDBG funding. So the CDBG, uh, the federal CDBG funding is spread over several agencies, not only LPC. So that's a general part. For example, a couple of years ago, we also received uh, funding, additional funding to our CDBG program for an upgrade of one of our systems, our urgent system. So that was funding. That was extra funding we got in our budget that was taken from another part of the city's federal funding that wasn't spent. So that happens uh, where if there's funding that LPC is not able to use, but there's another city, pro another city agency that has federal CDBG programs, that money can be spent on those, uh, on those agencies too if they request so, it. So, so f funding that's not used, so there's $115,000 that you get for grants. Yes. You know, you've only 10, 10 applicants in a matter of three years. So there's money that's being rolled over to the special fund, the separate fund that you have uh, for funding that you get from the federal government that you don't use. Am I following you there? So, so within the 115,000, say we were able to award grants uh, for, pro for projects that total $100,000, just as, as an example. So of those grants that total $100,000, the remaining $15,000, unfortunately, that's money that's left on the table that we're not able to spend. That's money that's available citywide, a citywide CDBG program that another city agency could get, it could get transferred to another city agency if they request it from OMB. But that's something that LPC has not, be, has not been able to spend. Now, of the $100,000 that LPC allocated to projects, if the projects are not completed within the fiscal year, they won't for that $100,000, let's say half of it got completed for $50,000. The other $50,000, it was earmarked to these projects, but it weren't completed yet. That $50,000 gets rolled over to the next fiscal year. So those are the two different things in our budget. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, so if you use your example, that $15,000 that was left over, it gets put onto this federal f uh, city fund that you have there. Now, do other agencies have access to that money? Uh, the, at other agencies have access to the general CDBG funding. Now, there are different criteria. That's OMB, OMB decides how, that's, how that is spent. But unfortunately, for that 15000 that LPC could not spend, unfortunately, that's money that LPC left on the table, but it's federal funding that's available uh, to the city. All right, I'm gonna, we're, we're gonna, uh, um, I'm gonna, I, I would like to inquire more on this in terms okay. of that funding, where the money goes, so we're gonna be sending you something uh, okay. to get more clarification sure. on that. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, go back to um, the new proposed rules. I have some questions here. Um, so in terms of your, um, on March 27th, your commission is going to vote on these new proposed rules. So why should primary facades, which are typically front on public streets or otherwise have a significant design or architectural feature, be permitted to be altered via staff approval rather than approved from the commissioners? Uh, okay, so just to, uh, to clarify, uh, March 27th, we're having a public hearing, but the commission is not going to be voting on that. So the process, we'll get comments, and typically we will we'll, uh, consolidate all those comments. We have, may have changes. Um, we may have the responses to those, and that'll come back to the commission later on. Um, so the issue with the, uh, the building facades, which we agree they have um, important features. I think we just have to be uh, sort of clear that the staff level approvals are not going to change what it historically looks like. Those kind of changes would come before the commission. What the staff level approvals will do is just, it, first of all, the staff approves, it's, it's basically restoration work. So it means that you know, the, this is what the historic building facade is, and there's upkeep that's required, or you know, the cornice is broken and you have to recreate it. Those kind of things can now be done at staff level. And overall, restoration. Yeah. 
Okay. It's a rule set, yeah. And in fact, there are, when it comes to the front facade, the rules are, in fact, more restrictive. So, uh, you, I, you know, the scope of work uh, of our rules, which sort of says building facades, rears, you know, ramps, uh, I think uh, it's good to know that they all include criteria and sort of a, a, sort of a philosophy behind them. So the restoration rules uh, for the front facades is in fact very conservative. It's all about, in fact, preserving and protecting uh, the historic features. So it's, if there are changes that are being made to the front facade which deviate or depart from what it was historically, then that will come before the commission. So for example, if somebody is coming before and asking that they remove their cornice or they, they want to widen their windows, then those kind of changes will have to come before the commission. All right. I want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Gibson. Um, what types of rooftop additions and rear yard additions or enlargements will the staff be allowed to approve under this proposed rule? And how does this differ from the exi existing rule? Okay. So in fact, uh, the current rules allow you to do rooftop, uh, rooftop additions uh, that are non-visible and uh, rear yard additions. Uh, so that's already allowed. The changes that we're proposing are very, they're actually very, very modest. And in terms of the rooftop additions, we're allowing for slightly, what we consider minimally visible uh, rooftop additions. And we're really talking about these additions that are visible either from very far away from the building or their, you know, oblique angles uh, that, uh, that where the, the rooftop addition cannot even be associated with the building. And so uh, that's kind of the, the change that we're proposing over there. In terms of the rear yard, our rules are actually going to be uh, in some ways more restrictive because it's going to only allow for two stories and um, it's going to actually include design criteria or basically the staff will be able to sort of regulate uh, the material and the windows um, at, uh, in the, these rear yard additions uh, more than they can do right now. And so um, it's, I think the design criteria is a very big, uh, uh, I think, great improvement of our rules right now. And we're talking about really small additions. So I think that, you know, we know that um, this is an issue. People have talked about it to us. And I just want to sort of give the council some sort of reassurance that the type of applications which are larger, uh, which are more complex, will continue to come before the commission. And um, yeah, I think. So those will, the larger ones will go. So we'll come before the commission. That There's no change there. It's really for uh, the very minimally visible rooftop additions and two-story uh, rear yard additions where now we can actually do more than that. Um, and I just want to point out one other thing about the rules, which is we're talking about especially the rear yard additions in what's considered the donuts, the area behind uh, where there's already at least 50% of, of, of the buildings already have these rear yard additions. So when you think about uh, the existing context, there's already an existing context which sort of supports the fact that you could, another person can come and have an addition. Right. So for rooftops and rear yard additions, the proposed rules define minimal visible as something that means certain measurable criteria, or does that not call attention to itself or distract from any significant uh, features and then provides a list of factors that staff must consider. Can you discuss these factors? Um, I'm sorry, can, someone, uh, can I ask you to repeat that again, yeah. please? I'm sorry. So for the rooftops yeah. and rear yards additions, yeah. the proposed rules defined defines minimal visible yes. as something that meets certain measurable criteria or does not call attention to itself or distract from any significant features, and then provides a list of factors that staff must consider. Can you discuss these factors? Um, so In other words, why are you proposing to change the, defi the, the definition of minimal visible from the old definition? Uh, because what we have found is that this minimal, uh, minimally visible, which is really the, the change, 
has been routinely approved by the commission. I, every time it's come before the commission, it has been approved. So that is a, that's the sort of theory. So, so why should system. staff be making these decisions and not the and and, and not the commission and without public without it going through a public process? Because it's a, well, there there are two sort of ideas here. One is that applications that come before the commission are worked first are reviewed by staff. So the staff already works with applicants to reduce visibility. And so it's only when they've, so in some ways, they've actually crafted the level of visibility. And so then when it comes before the commission, the commission approves it. It's, it's, it's become, uh, I think the staff understands what the commission is looking for and what but is- then they're not the commissioners. They're not, yeah. but they are essentially working on applications to bring them to a point which is considered- They're preparing applications for commissioners and commissioners should make that final determination. That's the point that I'm making here. You're empowering staff and you're, you're cutting a process and, and, and so you're just making the assumption that the commissioners are just gonna approve this. Um, but I feel that well, staff should not be making these right. decisions. The commissioners, mm -hmm. sh right. the commission should make this decision. Right. I think we're not talking about we're, we're making the assumption that commission commissioners will approve it. The commissioners do approve it, and the commissioners ap uh, approve it routinely and consistently. And, and, and the commissioners don't have questions when they come up and they bring these applications. So they, you're telling me they're just rubber stamping these applications? It's, I think it's because, yes, I think what Sarah was telling, it's because these, the visibility is so minimal, it's, it's, it's minor. It's in fact, for the same reasons that we, you know, just what I said before was that it's, you know, disconnected from, um, uh, you know, let's say it's, it's disassociated from the building. So we're talking about views that are very far off from the building itself. Um, they're usually in a situation where there are other rooftop uh, additions or buildings behind it. And uh, you cannot actually sort of, you can barely see it and it does not detract from the, you know, from either the historic district or the building where it's situated. Right. So, the, so the, the, the criteria is based on the standards that the commission already uses and the staff is very experienced in the commission's commissioners' standards that they apply because they routinely prepare these applications every month and they listen to the commissioners. And we're talking about the kind of visibility that's so minimal that you can't even tell what building it's on. It's through an, an eight-foot alley looking into the back of other buildings against the backdrop of apartment buildings and you don't see which building the addition is on and you're only seeing two feet of it. So it's very incidental views that are, as the chair said, disassociated from the building itself and in the context of other additions and taller buildings. Anything that is more visible or um, noticeable would still be uh, reviewed and approved by the full commission. All right. um, my and next Jan question. And Go ahead, uh, Council Member, I just I wanted to just point out that you know the rules that. Um, we have proposed, and a part of that process is the commission, our commission will have to approve those rules as well. So this is, you know, they're gonna be aware of this, and so uh, they're, uh, they are kind of the integral part of the process. The, the commission has to adopt the rules. All right, how long does it usually take to obtain a certificate of appropriateness via the commission review for these types of changes that we just discussed? Uh, well, uh, typically, I think uh, um, it's somewhere between, you know, I don't know six, three to six months. Three to six months. Yeah. All right. And how long is it expected for approval to take uh, place if these determinations are delegated to staff? Uh, you know, if once the application is complete, uh, it's usually about 30 days. And uh, in some cases, it's as a little as 20 days. Um, all right. And just, yeah, I think one other point I just want to make is because some of these changes are so minimal, it really, I, we see this as a, we do see it as a cost effective measure as well. And uh, it allows for more certainty in the process. 
the criteria is clear, so it's more transparent. And I, you know, the intent is really to uh, to uh, to lessen some of the burdens for property owners because we are talking about work which is done, you know, routinely. Has a uh, compromise been considered, such as LPC staff posting the proposal information on the website with an opportunity for the public to comment to the staff within a certain number of days of posting? Uh, well, right now what we're doing, you know, we've, we've done a lot of outreach. We know there are different comments that will come in. And uh, I think part of, uh, we're looking forward to having our public hearing uh, next week, but it does, that's where we're hoping to sort of hear comments and uh, and then you know we'll take that under consideration so uh, right now we haven't but uh, you know we're waiting uh, the public process uh, and comments will help us uh, continue to refine the proposal right. would would uh, LPC support some type of public review of staff determinations I think we'll have to look at that uh, council member okay I want to recognize we've been joined by uh, council member Traeger um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Chair Adams for more questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had uh, one, uh, one more question. I keep saying one more question, but this really is one more question. Uh, you, you've had a move pending for a while. Do you know when you will be moving? Uh, we uh, have our public hearing on the 27th. No, the move, so I'm the sorry. Move, the, move. the move. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so focused on the rules. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, we believe that we sh by the end of this year, the work will be done. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be able to do it. Calendar. Okay. Calendar year. Yes. Calendar year. Okay. Yeah, the calendar thank you. Year. That was so my question. In, uh, yeah. Late, uh, late fall, early uh, winter. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Traeger has some questions. Thank you, chairs, um, and welcome. Uh, great to see you, great to see you, Chair. Uh, so I, I, f forgive me if I missed this earlier. Uh, I'm hearing the news that we will have soon a calendared item of landmarking the boardwalk at LPC. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Unfortunately, you weren't here when we broke that good news. But uh, yes, we intend to bring this uh, before the commission on March 20th, and we're going to recommend that the commission calendar this property as a. Well, I, I greatly appreciate that and, and the work of, of your of your staff as well, and I thank you for personally coming down with your team to Coney Island, um, and so just just for clarity, uh, so March 20th is the date that you'll recommend for it to be calendar. Calendar, is that correct? Yes. And just so um, I calm the concerns of, of my constituents. Uh, since some items that have been calendared or on the calendar have been backlogged for quite some time, folks in my community would like to be alive, including me, uh, will, for worry. the day for this to happen. Can you yeah. just give us a time frame of uh, what that means? Uh, we think we can, you know, we, it's after we calendar, we could have a public hearing and we hope to try, and since, you know, obviously this is a uh, process, but we'd like to complete it either in spring or summer. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. I look forward to our continued partnership and making this a reality. But Chair, this is, this is a big, big, big news. Uh, working with uh, my colleague, Councilman Deutsch, and my office with LPC and many residents and stakeholders, we will finally see the legendary, iconic Coney Island Boardwalk become a landmark in New York City. And it happened without any lobbyists, no conservancies, a complete grassroots effort from the community. Thank you for your chairs. And so, Chair Salamanca, you, you were supportive of this in the resolution. And your Chair Adams, I appreciate your support as, as well. So thank you very much. Congrats, Councilmember okay. Traeger. Thanks. Just want to recognize that we've been uh, joined by Councilmember Deutsch. Um, I just have a f maybe one last question. Um, have there been conversations with your agency uh, in terms of there being some federal cuts to your funding? Um, well, as you know, the administration is ver working very hard to sort of stave off any kind of uh, federal funding cuts. And so uh, this past year, it has not impacted us at all. Uh, and we'll, you know, we understand, we don't know what will happen, but we'll be, we know that the administration will continue to fight any cuts at the federal level that will affect our agency. 
Um, and what is included in the community development funding budget? So uh, the community development funding budget is roughly about uh, $595,000. Uh, about $473,000 is uh, for um, uh, uh, basically 10 staff um, positions, um, and those include five full-time and five part-time. Uh, they are for research and survey work. Uh, they are basically our, um, fund our environmental review, and they also fund uh, archaeology, um, our archaeology division, and and uh, the grant program. So, so uh, well, let, let me just uh, four hundred seventy-three thousand uh, is for um, the these four issues. Then we have one hundred fifteen thousand, which is for the grant, and then we have about eight thousand, which is for you know its administrative costs. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Um, is there any uh, testimony or questions from members of the public? No. Seeing none, thank you, Commissioner, and your team for, test for your testimony today. We will now take a short recess. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Committee. All right. Good morning, everyone. Now we will continue the land use preliminary budget hearing and hear from the, uh, the Director of City Planning, Maurice Alago. The Department of City Planning is the agency responsible for creating a vision for the future of our city and responsible for the orderly development of our city. We hope today's hearing will shed light on how DCP allocates funding and staff time to engage with communities and land use decisions and that we will be able to provide the public with more information on outstanding planning initiatives being conducted by DCP. We're looking forward to hearing more about the new needs reflected in city planning's $45.5 million budget, efforts to increase language access to critical agency develop documents and services, as well as agency reporting on neighborhood development funding levels and agency priorities for the coming year. I have spoken to many of my colleagues leading up to this hearing, and I want to highlight a few themes that have emerged. One. During the pre-application process where a number of critical decisions are made about private application, there is very limited consultation with council members. Our expectation is that DCP consults with council members, the land use staff, to ensure that these decisions have council support so we can avoid a disagreement later in the process when the stakes are higher. Two, the department has often said to council members that they are not that there are not the resources to undertake important planning work. With additional resources, do you need to be responsive to the range of requests that you believe have merit from this council? And three, more broadly, on partnership and communication, I think we can do a lot better to ensure that we work together to advance shared policy goals rather than protect decisions making authority. At the end of the day, I believe we will, we will accomplish a lot less now working together. I hope you take these feedbacks to heart as you work with the new council. The zoning subcommittee is chaired by Council Member Moya. I want to acknowledge the chair's leadership on city planning issues. Before we turn it over, I want to thank ch um, the chair and his team for joining us today. And with that, uh, the council will swear you in. Um. Please state your names. Maurice Salago. Purnima Kapoor. John Kaufman. Anita Laramont. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give today, including your responses to all questions, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. Well, good morning, Chair Salamanca and Subcommittee Chairs Moya and Adams and in absentia, Kalos, and also the distinguished members of the Land Use Committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the Department of City Planning's, DCP's, preliminary FY19 budget. As you've just heard, I'm joined by Anita Laramont, our Chief Analytical Officer and General Counsel, Purnima Kapoor, our Executive Director, and John Kaufman, our Chief Operating Officer. Although the focus of the hearing is the FY19 budget, I'd like to begin with comments on the agency's work program and the exciting services and tools that our budget allocations allow us to provide for the public. Since the start of this administration, DCP has remained dedicated to the mayor's goals of addressing inequality and making New York City the fairest big city in America. 
by fostering economic opportunity, planning for the creation of permanently affordable housing, and investing in neighborhoods, we're already helping New Yorkers to continue to afford to live in their city. But to state the obvious, there's plenty more to do. One measure of fairness is the equitable allocation of federal funding. The federal census count directly affects federal funding levels for many programs that are absolutely critical to the well-being of New Yorkers. These include SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Section 8 housing programs, bridge construction and repairs, and grants to local educational agencies to serve disadvantaged youth. Since this federal funding is based on population, we must have an accurate 2020 census. This is a top priority for DCP, and we're so pleased that this priority is shared by the Council. The members of DCP's Population Division are nationally recognized experts in counting urban areas. And while 2020 may seem far off, they are already out in the field finding housing units throughout all of the five boroughs that should be counted. Turning to economic development, I want to highlight last August's Council vote on the rezoning of East Midtown. It's just seven months after the rezoning, and we're delighted that one of the city's most iconic and largest employers, J.P. Morgan Chase, has announced the redevelopment of its headquarters in East Midtown. With 2.5 million square feet of office space planned, this new headquarters building is expected to house 15,000 jobs. Chase's decision gives us confidence that there's a bright future for East Midtown. And in addition, the sale of air rights to allow Chase's new headquarters building will result in tens of millions of dollars going to public realm and transit improvements. Now, the East Midtown rezoning is facilitating the growth of Class A office space. But if we're to combat inequality and grow the middle class and also adapt to ever-changing technologies in the workplace, the city also has to invest in a range, a wide range of industries with high wages and job potential, and industries that don't need to or even don't wish to be located in Manhattan. In downtown Brooklyn, in Long Island City, in Broadway Junction, DCP is looking at targeted localized solutions. As just one example, the administration's New York Works Plan finds that downtown Brooklyn, which is a fast-growing neighborhood sitting on top of 13 subway lines and a regional LIRR station, is well positioned to increase the supply of office space. Ensuring that there is both the volume and the variety of workspace to accommodate the full range of today's employers is essential if we're going to capitalize on downtown Brooklyn's attractiveness as a residential neighborhood. Further, if we can intercept Brooklyn commuters before they cross the river, this has the potential to ease congestion in Manhattan subway lines and also to lower the commute times for many Brooklyn residents. I apologize for the breaks. I'm getting over the flu and my voice hasn't still recovered. Um, in addition to looking at particular neighborhoods, DCP is also looking at our citywide regulations to identify where they pose barriers to growth. Our zoning regulations for office and other workspace were largely written over 50 years ago, and many of them are now outdated. The way we work has not only changed dramatically over the last half century, but it continues to evolve rapidly. Our zoning shouldn't stand in the way of creating the types of spaces that are needed for the jobs of today and tomorrow, especially at highly accessible locations. Let me give you a few examples of obsolete rules that are on the books and are getting in the way of private sector growth. Um, businesses are increasingly gravitating towards rehabilitated loft buildings because of their beauty, their cool factor, and also because the layouts of these loft buildings reflect the needs of today's business culture. But if you look at our zoning, it makes it nearly impossible to build a new loft-style office building today. A second example, craft breweries are making a serious comeback, but the zoning that regulates craft breweries was adopted in the 1960s, in 1961 to be exact. These half-century-old zoning laws make it almost impossible to find sites for breweries 
outside of the heaviest industrial districts. The final example that I'll give you is outmoded parking requirements, which can not only deter construction of new buildings in areas that are well served by mass transit, they can also present, prevent existing businesses from being able to enlarge. So we're taking a hard look at these impediments and figuring out how we can modernize our zoning requirements to encourage job growth. Now, in addition to supporting job growth, DCP is focused on comprehensive neighborhood planning that increases the number of new homes in the city with a special focus on affordable housing, coupled with appropriate neighborhood investments. Last week, the Council Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee, as well as this Land Use Committee, voted to support the Jerome Avenue Community Plan. Thank you so very much. We estimate that this plan would bring approximately 4,600 new homes to the area, about a quarter of which would be required to be permanently affordable under the city's mandatory inclusionary housing, MIH program. As part of the plan, the city has committed to make major investments in the Jerome Avenue corridor. Council members Gibson and Cabrera deserve special congratulations for their dedicated work in shaping this important plan and fighting for their communities every step of the way. Last year, the council approved both the downtown Far Rockaway plan and the East Harlem plan, resulting in new housing growth. Um, a new housing growth opportunities, but also significant neighborhood improvements. And DCP continues to conduct comprehensive neighborhood planning. With strong leadership by Council Member Lander, the Gowanus Neighborhood Planning Study is well underway. Our intensive in-person stakeholder engagement has been augmented by DCP's online community engagement portal. It's the first time that we've used an online mechanism to solicit feedback. It received over 2,000 pieces of e-feedback, so we're quite pleased that it was so well received. Um, at an earlier phase is DCP's Southern Boulevard neighborhood planning study. Together with our sister agencies, DCP aims to engage community residents and the full range of stakeholders in a ground up comprehensive neighborhood study that will create a unified vision through collaboration. We look forward to working closely with Land Use Chair Salamanca on opportunities to protect and increase affordable housing, strengthen retail and local businesses, increase pedestrian safety and walkability, and revitalize the war waterfront improving community resources. Now, turning to housing, to address the crying need for housing in an already dense and built up city, DCP is focusing on identifying underutilized land. For example, if you look at our Jerome Avenue, East New York, and East Harlem neighborhood plans, we proposed zoning that encouraged the construction of buildings adjacent to elevated rail lines this leveraged land that had once been thought too difficult to develop. But our most important tool to spur the construction of affordable housing is MIH, which increases the stock of affordable housing permanently. The statistics bear out the wisdom of the council in adopting MIH. I'll give you a few statistics. In 2017 alone, the City Planning Commission approved 11,000 total residential units through both public applications and private applications under MIH. 2,800 of these units must be permanently affordable. If we step back a little further and look back from the date of the adoption of the MIH program through March 2nd of this year, we've approved 1,800, I, I'm sorry, 18,000 total units, 4,800 of which must be permanently affordable, and there's a robust pipeline going forward. Another topic that I'd like to touch upon briefly, a topic that is critical for a city that has 520 miles of coastline and a city that is still bearing the scars of Superstorm Sandy, is resilience. In 2017, the council adopted the special coastal risk districts um, that place zoning limitations on future developments on portions of the east shore of Staten Island, and in Queens, the Hamilton Beach and Broad Channel neighborhoods. All of these rezonings have the goal of planning for sea level rise in these especially high-risk neighborhoods. 
and they were greeted with especially strong community support. DCP is currently working on an update to the flood resilience zoning that was adopted by the City Council as an emergency mem uh, measure in 2013. This 2013 measure eliminated zoning constraints to rebuilding in the flood zone after Superstorm Sandy. We expect to advance a citywide amendment to this flood, flood resilience zoning later this year, and we look forward to continuing to engage with council members and local communities on this important resiliency initiative. I'd also like to highlight a recently released DCP report, the Resilient Industry Study. Um, this study identifies cost-effective strategies that industrial businesses in the floodplain can choose to use to reduce their flood risk and to be able to restore operations quickly in the event of future flooding. This study is purposely not a rezoning. It's not regulatory. It is intended to serve as a toolkit to help inter interested industry stakeholders. Now, to more effectively plan in concert with communities, something that Chair Salamanca mentioned, DCP strives to be at the forefront of sharing relevant neighborhood planning information to help the public, including council members and community boards, be as informed as possible. This includes giving communities access to cutting edge web tools. I won't describe these newly developed e-tools at length, other than to note that the community district portal, which I had the pleasure of sharing with Chair Salamanca, our zoning and land use application, which is called Zola, and the online community district needs and requests application are absolute game changers in the quantity and quality of granular information that they provide to the general public as well as the ease of their use. Finally, I'll turn to the budget itself. DCP began FY18 with an adopted budget of 49.5 million and an authorized headcount of 351 full-time staff lines, of which 32.8 million and 159 positions are funded with city tax level, levy dollars. DCP's remaining $16.7 million budget application and 192 positions are funded primarily by the federal government. This $49.5 million budget allocates $28.4 million to agency-wide personnel services and $21.1 million to non-personnel services. In comparison to DCP's FY adopted budget, the FY19 preliminary demonstrates a 3.9 million and 11 uh, position reduction. My written statement goes into extreme detail on a line by line basis about the details of our budget, but the top line message is that despite a decline in funding, the mayor's FY19 preliminary budget adequately supports DCP's robust work program and allows us to meet the needs of New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to recognize that we've been joined by uh, Chair Kalos. And I just want to also just uh, give uh, Chair Kalos a shout out. Welcome back from paternity leave. I see that um, you're having a good time. <laughs> Uh, and I also want to recognize we've been joined by uh, Council Member Barron. Uh, so um, just have a few questions here in terms of staffing. So as of February of this year, the department has an active headcount of 288 positions, while the fiscal year 2019, you're proposing 340, you're, you're proposing 340 positions. Um, but there's a rent freeze in, in your agency at the moment. So why are you, uh, in, in this budget, why are you requesting an increase in, in, um, in your headcount when you still have a vacancy that you have not filled? I'd be glad to explain that, um, Chair Salamanca. Um, we have currently 19 positions that are in the hiring process. Seven of them have already been hired. They're just going through the processing. Another 12 are already posted. We also have four people who are on leave and expecting to return, so we're holding the positions open so that they can return from their leaves. 
We have a number of dormant positions, um, 16 federally funded positions that are dormant. These are grant funded. And what we have elected to do is to spend the grant funds more slowly at a, lo at a slower pace so that we can carefully manage grant funding. Finally, we have 12 positions that are yet to be hired, seven of which are detailed in our new requests that were just approved in January. And so while the overall number may sound large as we go through it piece by piece, we actually are quite comfortable with our ability to one, satisfy the work program of city planning, but also to be able to bring people on board in needed positions. So how many positions are available that are not grant funded that you can control right now at the moment? We currently have 16 grant funded positions that we are holding open. Um, can you talk to me about has a uh, staff turnover affected the department's ability to keep these positions filled? No one likes staff turn turnover, but as a manager for decades, it is an absolute fact of life. We would actually note um, members of the council staff who have come from the Department of City Planning, and we welcome seeing our planners go to other positions within city government, within the administrative branch. Uh, fortunately, we have found that city planning is an employer of choice for planners, and so we have been fortunate in being able to recruit to backfill these positions. All right. um, on a totally different topic, prior commitments. The mayor has committed to the council in writing as part of the MIH negotiations that the administration will revise the voluntary inclusionary housing program to produce more affordable housing. The administration has not lived up to the end of the bargain. What's taking so long? We remain committed to relooking at the voluntary inclusionary housing program. And as we mentioned at the beginning, the look was, is very dependent on the contours of the 421A program. So starting with the adoption of the revised 421A program, we have been working internally to look at this. We expect in the next few weeks to be able to sit down with the council's staff and talk through our preliminary ideas about how the VIH, the voluntarily, Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program, should be adopted. I would also note that HPD has already adopted new rules that prohibit the use of 421A units to generate off-site bonuses. Um, this ensures that we promote affordable housing production without over-subsidizing units. So we are very much looking forward to the conversation with council staff. So when are those conversations going to happen? In the next few weeks. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to open it up for my colleagues to ask questions. I'm going to start with Council Member Lansman. I'm, and, and, he was on, and then from there we're going to go to Chair Moya, Council Member Miller, and then Chair Kalos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Good morning. Are we still in the morning? Yes. Barely. Good morning. Um, I had asked you to uh, provide some information on the length of time that it takes for applicants to get um, uh, plans approved, and, and you included that in your testimony, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I really do. So I, I just want to drill down a, a little bit on, on, on that. You, you, you say that a large portion of the review process is beyond the control of the Department for City Planning, especially when applicants submit incomplete materials and are not responsive to DCP requests for required information. Um, so tell me, uh, how, how often is it that you have applicants who uh, are, are really unable to, to provide you with the information that you need? I, I, you know, I raise these questions because in speaking with the the real estate community, it comes up a, a lot. These are professionals by and large. They're spending a lot of money and they're hiring experts to, to, to do most of these, these applications. I mean, is that really a recurring problem that the developers can't get their act together? 
Thank you for the question, council member. It's all over the lot. Um, when people think of the development process, we tend to think of the largest developments, but we also process um, routine subdivisions, smaller applications. And the reasons why a project applicant might choose not to respond immediately could have things unrelated to the request. The financing could have fallen through, the market could have changed, and so applications have, or applicants have many reasons. Sometimes they encounter, as they are developing their project or their plans for the project, would discover that economic subsoil conditions are changing. Um, were you finished? I didn't want to interrupt. Okay. So, um, you testify that uh, despite the increased amount of complex applications, DCP's overall MMR performance figure in FY17 was at 75 percent above the pre-established target of 70 percent, and year-to-date you're tracking at 78 percent. So you describe a little bit ab above, I think, what um, determines whether or not you're, you're on target. So, so what is an on-target uh, process from your perspective in, for approvals? The target is an estimation of, on average, what we would expect. And again, I would note the wide variation in our applications, ranging from a, um, a subdivision all the way up to a neighborhood rezoning. And what we attempted to do was to break it into two very large and inexact uh, categories, one of which is the smaller, less complex projects, and the others, which are our more major activities. I'm always struck in a discussion about the length of time um, that some applicants believe that it takes too long. Some communities believe that the process isn't long enough. Um, I do think that we as a city should be proud of having in place for decades a time-tested process that gives predictability that there will be a seven-month land use review process and a process that provides multiple op points of opportunity for the public to participate in the formal land use review process. So is it for each category of application or, 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 or each type of application, you've got, you've got different targets? And, and they're actual targets. Th this is a six-month, this is a, some of them are 15 months, I mean, is, is that how you, 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 an application comes in, you put it in a category, and you're like, okay, this is in the six-month range, and this is in the 15-month range? Yes, and I'll turn it over to John Kaufman, who is the keeper of our metrics. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. The targets were set, again, as, as the Chair has described, based on looking historically how long these things take and then trying to make them all shorter with this administration. The, Duration does depend a lot on the type of zoning action, and that's why the 15-month ones all involve Seeker, which we all know takes a lot longer to sort of get through that process. So that's why those are, are so much longer, and they are the very large, complex ones that we've had an increase on recently. Um, we revisit those targets from time to time, um, and we want always to do better, and you'll see we have been made an improvement in that overall. At the end of the day, again, applicants can erratically impact our numbers if in a given period of time they just don't have the materials ready or they do have you know, financing difficulties or th something's changed in the marketplace. Um, so uh, I, I, my understanding is that there's been an increase in applications the last few years, whether it's to meet new, new, the new zoning regime that was put in place or just increased economic activity. Have, have, has, the, has the department increased the, the amount of staff to review these applications? And if you can give me those numbers. The answer is clearly yes, that this administration has been very supportive of increasing the staff at city planning. And I would note in particular the increase in staff in the environmental assessment and review division because a significant part of land use review is the legally required environmental assessment. And um, Anita Laramont oversees this, and so I will turn it to her to talk about the increase in her department. Yes. So we have very significantly increased the number of staff, and we've endeavored to try to match the staffing to the complexity and volume of work that we see now so that we can support the efforts of the agency and not be a bottleneck in terms of 
our ability to get things to certification in a timely fashion. But we have to point out that we have a very wide range of types of, of projects and where an environmental uh, impact statement is required, the lead time is significantly longer than it is for projects where that isn't required and can take up to a year, sometimes a year and a half, just for the completion of that aspect of the application. And would more staffing make that process go quicker or just the nature of the, the, the inquiry? No, we believe that we are now properly staffed after having significantly increased the amount of staff. But again, it is the nature of the application, the complexity, and in particular, the environmental assessment, which is a multi-part multi assessment <laughs> across many factors. All right. Well, I appreciate your coming with this information and being able to answer these, these questions. I think it's a conversation that we need to continue because I do hear it from developers across the board, both big and small. I'm guessing you do too. I'm sure some of it is they're just chomping at the bit to get their project done, but I'm not sure that with the ebb and flow of, of applications that um, the department's staffing has kept up or, or, been, or, or been aligned, and not through any fault or lack of will on your part, but things do need to just move quicker than, than they are. I'd welcome that conversation. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Lansman. Now we'll hear from uh, Chair Moya. Thank you, Chairman Salamanca, and uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for your testimony today. Uh, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the issue of performance measures, um, especially when it comes to the planning information and policy initiatives that are presented um, to the public. Uh, in our neighborhoods and uh, community boards, uh, they're struggling to keep up in the face of gentrification and displacement. How much money has been allocated to help communities or uh, contribute into the neighborhood planning? The issue of gentrification is one that affects so many of our neighborhoods and certainly comes up in the context of our neighborhood-wide rezonings. The way to address gentrification is through a whole-of-government approach. It is not something unique to or re rezoning is the sole answer. We work hand-in-glove from the outset of a neighborhood plan with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Um, we welcome the Council's adoption of a right to counsel law. We welcome the other measures undertaken by HPD, um, whether it is the landlord ambassadors, whether it is going with the community affairs unit door to door on door knocks to make sure that tenants are aware of their rights. Um, but again, if one looks just at the rezoning, one misses the entirety of the tools that we bring to bear to address this issue. So, but just how much money is actually allocated um, to help those communities? So when you're talking about those programs, how much actual money goes into your budget? I don't have access to HPD's breakdown of the dollars that they've dedicated to each of the programs. I could note that on a community by community rezoning basis, we don't go in with a fixed statement that there are X amount of dollars for this program. We look at what the need is in the community and then work with HPD to craft the right set of tools. Um, I'd also notice, note actually that it is also not just HPD. They come to mind first and foremost, but also the Department of Buildings with its focus on enforcement responding to complaints about the conditions within housing. Um, also, the planning process is, is very difficult to comprehend. Uh, how much money is, or how much funding is given to community boards um, to look through this very complicated planning process? I'm afraid I don't have at my fingertips the council's allocations for community boards, but we can follow up on that. So, but is it that you rely on the council members to individually fund that, or is? Um, the community boards are funded through the city's budget process. It's not city planning that directly 
funds any of that. What we do is provide our staff resources to communities. We have liaisons to each of the 59 community boards who are available to those community boards for all kinds of planning efforts. We also provide a lot of resources in assisting the community boards in, uh, in putting together their community needs statements, in um, aligning their needs with various agencies. So our support to the communities is through our own staff. So well, why wouldn't we want to have ingrained in the DCP budget money that would actually help train community boards to understand this process? If we have right now uh, an initiative by this administration that is looking to upzone all of our neighborhoods, these are volunteers. They're not experts. So when these plans come in, they're not individuals that have the opportunity to understand this process. So my, my question is why wouldn't DCP dedicate a funding stream to educate community boards on the rezoning issues? Um, we dedicate our staffing to that purpose. I mean, we don't, our budget does not give us a distinct line for that kind of support, but we are neighborhood based. We have offices in all five community uh, boroughs, as you know. We have planning liaisons to each of the community boards. We attend all the meetings and we do work with new community board members each year to provide support in understanding the land use process. Our staff I is I might available. add on this that um, picking up on something that Ms. Kapoor just mentioned, which is that in some instances we see community boards that have had stability both in their membership and also in their district managers and that are quite expert. When we see that there is a community board where there has been significant turnover, we send our neighborhood liaison, our experts out to conduct a training on zoning and land use, recognizing that it is a, um, while we understand our neighborhood and the fabric of it, the language that is used in zoning can be different. Um, we recently conducted um, such a training for a community board in Brooklyn, which was just so well received. So we would always welcome from either council members or from com community boards requests for input. Um, I would just ask, uh, add to that, we also train them on the new tools that we discussed before. So things like the community portal and Zola, we have regular training sessions for all new council board, community board members to join and get, understand uh, the tools they can use to understand our processes better. Let me elaborate on that. Um, the community boards for years have put out a statement of needs and then their requests. Historically, these were separate processes and they were done on paper. Over the past few years, we have developed a uniform online portal so that the requests that come in are now in a standard format across the city. Um, this has been received tremendously well by the community boards. And again, to Ms. Kapoor's point of using our staff, we sent out our staff to work with each of the community boards so that they would understand how to use the new online portal. The portal actually benefited from our consultation with the community boards because they gave us feedback. We view this as a win-win because at this point, with the information, the community's needs and statement of needs and requests coming in electronically, we have found that agencies are able more quickly to be able to respond. And we put out publicly for each community board what their top three requests were. And this is, a, again, a way using our new technology to bring more transparency, to bring more information to the public, including community boards. So I'll give you just a prime example of what, what, what's going on. Community Board 4 just recently had a meeting um, on uh, what was a rezoning, um, a building that was coming in. The Land Use Committee um, was trying to explain what the rezoning was about. At the end, it wasn't explained right because they didn't understand the process. And then it gets voted down because they were fighting over who took over for the lease on the building. 
And so that's where we get very complicated. And my point is that what we need is a dedicated funding stream because if we don't, communities like ours, community boards three and four, are the ones that are going to be suffering from a lot of these rezonings that come into our communities. So for me, it's very critical that when you say that there are these trainings, I can say we haven't seen that, okay? Um, and I would like to see if there's been requests from Community Board 4 or 3, and if you have gone out there to reach out to them, I'd like to see if that's uh, been done, and if you can get that back to me, I'd appreciate that. And council um, member, I will take your raising it as a request, and we'll reach out to the district managers for both, both community boards. Great. Um, also, obviously, the community boards are short-staffed. They can't compete with the developers. Uh, they have massive budgets. How much money would it cost to create and give clinics to explain the rezoning and the Euler process? Again, our staff stands ready to conduct these trainings. Um, given that they are at the Department of City Planning, are trained as planners, they have the appropriate expertise. And as Ms. Kapoor mentioned, we do have a liaison for every community board. In addition to that, I will add that um, m I, I think almost every borough president at the beginning of the fiscal year when new community board members are brought into community boards holds sessions on land use our staff works closely with that to actually go conduct a specific training on land use and on the Euler process for new community board members. We stand ready to supplement so, that on an ongoing so I, basis. I, I understand you have that, but I think there needs to be a more proactive approach to the community boards where there needs to be, uh, a, I think, a, 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 a better thought out process on how you, that outreach is done so that they know that this is, these resources are there for them. Um, because I attend almost every community board uh, meeting possible. Uh, I go to the land use meetings as well. And you can see that they are struggling because they don't understand it. They don't know that these resources are available. And I think that's very important when rezonings are coming into communities, communities of color that are facing a real threat of gentrification uh, in our communities. Uh, Welcome. As I said, we've taken your request or your mention of community boards three and four as a request for training, and we would welcome requests from other council members who would want to have um, training as broad or as narrow that would be useful to them. And also, um, one last question on, on, on performance measures. Uh, have there been uh, budget allocations for studies on the impact the rezonings have on low-income children and seniors? Um, each of our neighborhood plans that goes through a rezoning process has an extensive um, assessment of every impact that is required under the EIS, the Environmental Impact Category. So that is our disclosure document on the impacts of whatever actions are going through the process. Okay. Um, on neighborhood planning, uh, considering all the resources uh, going into changing whole neighborhoods through rezoning, uh, has DCP considered uh, putting the same resources into analyzing and breaking down uh, AMIs to the community board levels? Uh, to give real affordability? The issue of AMIs is a challenging one, and for purposes of federal funding programs, the AMIs are set at the federal level. We're, if I might continue, we're very aware of the fact that the AMIs um, that are set at a broader level don't match the community district AMIs, and in our neighborhood rezonings, we work very closely with HPD to look for ways of driving affordability ever lower. Um, I would use as an example the um, Jerome Avenue rezoning that was recently approved by this committee where there were commitments both to housing preservation but also to looking 
at lower levels of affordability. I would note that this is done not just in the context of neighborhood rezonings, but in the Peninsula Project, for example, was another example of working with council members, with HPD, to look for ways to make the affordability more than the minimum that is required by the programs. But we know that Rockland County and Westchester County actually took themselves out of that, and they're not included in that AMI process. Why can't we do that here? I'm afraid that I am not an expert on the AMI process. I would be glad to consult with my colleagues at HPD and get back. I, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya. I just want to piggyback on s some of the uh, comments that uh, Chair Moya made. You know, I was, uh, as a previous district manager for five and a half years, city planning never offered a training in my community board. The only time, and I know this predates you, but the only time whenever they would come and want to educate the community is when they wanted to push one of their own projects. And that's a reality. How many city planners do you have uh, available in all five boroughs that are available to, to, to all 59 community boards? Right now, excuse me, right now there's about 96 spread across the five boroughs. 96 in all five boroughs? A varying tenure across. And can you give me the, uh, the breakdown per borough? How many city planners you have per borough? The, we, there is some flexibility depending on how active a certain borough is versus another, and so they're a little bit, um, we do like them to get attached to their neighborhoods, but over time they may shift between boroughs. Well, the Bronx and Brooklyn right now are very active, so I would love to see those numbers to see what breakdown there is in those two boroughs. You think you can get me that information before the end of this hearing? Sure. Sure. Thank you. The other thing that I might note, if I might, Chair, is that uh, picking up on Mr. Kaufman's point, when we realize that there is a lot of activity in a borough, we will assign from the central staff folks to be lodged in the borough. Um, I believe currently in the Bronx we have a transportation planner embedded in the borough. Uh, we assign members of our urban design division to be in the boroughs um, because we recognize that the activity ebbs and flows, and so we do have this um, surge capacity. Yeah. My, my other question, I raised this last year, and my concern is when there's a rezoning occurring, um, for example, in my community, I have a lot of grassroots organizations that are very involved because they're concerned with gentrification and the displacement of communities, and the local community boards, they're very involved, and they put out their recommendations. Um, at times, they feel that projects are not conducive for their communities. 10 out of 10 times, city planning, the city planning commission, will approve these projects against the local community boards. So are you really working with the local, local community and local grassroots organizations to address their issues before these projects are approved? Absolutely, council member. We work with communities and we recognize um, that frequently the case within communities is communities have multiple needs and don't always speak with one voice. We think it's important to engage, to we rely heavily upon the leadership of the council members because we recognize that the council is the ultimate decision maker. And we also recognize that at times the requests that are coming from the community are not land use requests. They go beyond that. And so if one looks at the discussion, the debate before the City Planning Commission, if one attends the public hearings and sees the questioning from the commission members, we will reflect things that we have heard that go beyond zoning, that go beyond land use. So we are not able to address them, but we know that discussions, as in the Jerome Avenue rezoning, or as in the, the Spofford, the Peninsula rezoning, issues that are outside the remit of the City Planning Commission can be addressed more broadly by the administration. My, my other question, then I'm gonna give it, hand it off to my colleagues for questions. I just went through my ninth Euler in the two years that I've been in the council. Um, thousands of new units approved, and I've ensured that there's a homeless set aside, and I've always done option one, ensuring that we have low income units and also mixed income units for my working, uh, my working families. There's, there's, a, there, there's an issue throughout the city of New York in terms of affordability. 
And I feel that other, in other districts, as ULIPs come up, um, more prominent districts, you know, we've encouraged our colleagues to go deeper in affordability in those projects. What is, what is your take on that? And are, can you be a partner with us to encourage other communities to go deeper in affordability uh, in terms of their, their, their land use projects? With respect to the level of affordability, we very much look to the council members who are the representatives of their districts. As we look at rezonings in particular, um, neighborhood rezonings, we recognize that the easiest to harvest opportunities are when they're a city-owned land because that gives us the most opportunity to bring to bear the tools. When it's a private application, again, there is a slightly different dynamic, but we would welcome a discussion with any council member about the need for affordability across the full range of incomes. Yeah, I really would encourage uh, your agency to, to partner at least with me and my other colleagues in low income communities to encourage my colleagues to go deeper in affordability because there's a need in terms of housing for low income families. All right, I am going to hand this off to uh, Council Member Miller. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, and thank you for your insightful, uh, your insight on, on the issues around this as well as uh, Chair Moyer. Um, Obviously, communities of color, we are, we, we are concerned with how do we maintain the cultural integrity of these communities and, and uh, what we have not seen. And, and, and um, quite frankly, it, you know, it, it even comes down to just cultural in integrity that sometimes I want to go to Chinatown to get Chinese food, right? I don't want to get it from the corner because I need that cultural authenticity because that is the character of New York City. So my line of question is how do we maintain the integrity of these communities um, that we've seen diminished over the past few de uh, decades and what role has uh, your agency played? Thank you for raising this important dimension of what defines a neighborhood because it is not just purely land use and whether it's an R5 or an R6 zoning district. I think we have a good example in the East New York neighborhood rezoning. Um, we at the time worked closely with a multitude of neighborhood organizations, but once a rezoning is adopted, we don't step back, walk away from the community. We worked with the community recently to apply for arts funding from the Department of Cultural Affairs and we're extremely pleased that there were a small number of grants, and one of them was granted to an arts, a very neighborhood-based arts organization in East New York. Um, the, this coming Saturday, actually, I won't be going to the St. Patrick's Day Parade because I'm joining a group who is going to go out and walk the neighborhood with the selected arts organization to be able to see the community through the eyes of the artists in the community. This was a need that was identified as part of the rezoning, and we were pleased to see it come to fruition and to see the Department of Cultural Affairs provide funding. Another example that I would give was in the rezoning of East Harlem, where again, neighborhood character was absolutely at the forefront. And in the discussions about what funding was needed, the need to support not just neighborhood businesses, but neighborhood arts organization came to the fore. And so, um, again, I welcome your interest on it, and I do think it's important as rezonings take place for neighborhood organizations and also council members to bring it to the fore. So, um, in, in as, as was mentioned before, in terms of engaging community and community boards and community groups, and what impact they would actually have. But I think the determination is, in fact, the matter that they've had realistically very little impact on what actually has occurred in terms of rezoning and, and, and so forth in these communities. In lieu of community participation, what cultural sensitivities do we have on from your side? Peripherally, if I look at those there, one would think that that exists, but the reality is that communities change every day and don't reflect the values of indigenous folks. What is the demographics of your staff? As I see diversity and recruitment, how do we know? Because the sentiment 
amongst my colleagues has always been, we create public policy and incentives and we turn it over to planning and it ends up being tree lined streets and bike lanes. And that's not the intent. What does the staff and, and look like and what could we do more to ensure that we're reflecting the values of these communities? I'm so glad that you raised the issue of staffing because I do think that, well, first, I will note that perhaps it's because of my age, but city planning is far and away the most diverse staff workplace um, that I've had the privilege of working in, and that includes having spent seven years in the Obama administration. Um, but we can do much better. With respect to gender, um, the gender divide rather accurately reflects the demographics, and I think you can look, this is the senior management team um, of city planning. With respect to race, we do quite well with respect to hiring Asian American planners, but with respect to African American um, and Hispanic planners, I think that we can do far better. Um, there are a number of initiatives that we've undertaken, and the one that I am most pleased by is that last year, and again this year, we're having a summer internship paid and historically, internships have been a stepping stone to getting a job. But if an internship is unpaid, we exclude a portion of the population that might not be able to afford to not get paid for the summer. Our last year's internship class was far and away the most diverse internship. And I must admit, as we are selecting interns, it is with a conscious eye to increase the diversity of our staff. With respect to the numbers themselves, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, and this is something that obviously we take quite seriously and we, we know we're planning with communities and need to represent those communities with the planners we put out there. I mean, our, our agency is, you know, there's very different ways to measure diversity. You know, one way would be, we would say is non-white. And our agency is 53% white and 47% non-white. Um, and that's, again, a, we know how important it is to represent all communities and diversities, and we, that number is the best it's been in five years. And so we, we recruit very aggressively. We track this every quarter. We try to make sure that we're going to places where we can get diverse candidates um, and, and bring, you know, bring them into the, the city if and I help build the city. I could pick up on going to the places, we're, we're fortunate at city planning that planners want to come work here. And so name the school, the planning school, folks want to come to city planning. Um, we focus on recruiting broadly, not just at the Ivy Leagues. I'm passionate about this because I'm a graduate of Cooper Union and know the value of going to smaller, perhaps less well-known schools that nonetheless produce exceptional candidates. The one other thing that I would want to mention that while information is not gathered um, with respect to the LGBTQI community, City planning is an employer of choice among the community, and that is a point of pride for us as well. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Uh, Councilman Reynoso. Thank you, Chair, um, and to my colleagues who are making comments um, uh, before me, um, I just want to recognize a common theme in regards to the rezonings happening in these neighborhoods. One, they're mostly happening in predominantly uh, black and brown districts, low income districts. Uh, and when we talk about community board uh, education and just preparing communities for, to engage in these rezonings, um, related to the budget, uh, it doesn't seem like DCP has a citywide plan to address the housing crisis or issue that we have here in the city of New York it feels more like DCP has a piecemeal approach of going into poor neighborhoods and looking to rezone them in an effort to address their housing issue. So um, as uh, maybe being a borough-wide director, uh, it would make sense that that's the approach you would take, maybe even, but as chair of the entire DCP, can you really speak to what your vision is related to the building of housing in the city of New York to address its crisis that also includes areas that are mainly or uh, predominantly white and affluent. Um, they seem to be completely out of the, the conversation so far. Um, and every single time a rezoning happens in this 
council, it seems like there's communities just busting down the doors to come in here to, tell, to, to, to let us know that they want us to stop those projects from happening. So what is your citywide vision? And do you have it? And if it's on paper, I would love to see it. Thank you for the question, council member. We've heard this frequently, so I appreciate the opportunity to address it. Um, we certainly have a citywide tool to address the affordable housing crisis, and that's MIH. It applies citywide. And when we think about the application of MIH, which allows us to require permanently affordable housing, we think about it in a number of different dimensions. One is the use of city-owned land, and that is where we work hand in glove with HPD. Because again, on city-owned land, there is the opportunity to go beyond the minimums that are required by the MIH program. But there are also the private applications, and we can't underestimate the significance of the private applications. They tend not to attract the same amount of attention as the neighborhood rezonings, but just the steady stream of private applications is chipping away. In my testimony are the numbers of, uh, the numbers of units that have been produced. Um, we wouldn't be reaching those numbers without the private applications. Turning to your question about how our neighborhoods selected, we look for two key criteria. One of them is neighborhood and council member support. We have undertaken neighborhood rezonings when council members, when neighborhood groups have come to us and said, we want a comprehensive neighborhood relook because absent community interest, um, it would be an exercise in futility. I would actually note on the Jerome Avenue uh, plan, it started in Council Member Gibson's district and Council Member Cabrera came to us and said, hey, I've got Jerome Avenue corridor in my district as well at us. Um, so we would, uh, so that's one factor. The second factor is looking at neighborhoods that are transit rich because putting housing in areas where it's tough to get to doesn't serve the purpose of having people in connected communities where the additional units provide people access to the subway system, to buses, and the ability to get to jobs. Um, so this would be a call not just to the members of this committee but to the whole council. We would welcome council members from districts of any economic strata coming to us and saying, please, let's undertake a comprehensive neighborhood plan that can result in more housing. I would also note that under Council Member Lander's leadership, we have been for the past few years actively engaged building on your Bridging Gowanus initiative in looking at the opportunities in the Gowanus neighborhood, which is an upper income neighborhood. So, you know, God bless Council Member Lander. He's like as lefty as they come in the city council. If there's any council member or any district that's gonna do their job to be a partner in, in building affordable housing in the city of New York, it's probably gonna happen in Council Member Brad Lander's district, one of the few affluent districts where I think it would happen. So I think you guys are, you know, I don't want you to use him as an example. I think he's an exception and his district is an exception. Um, but where it does happen are mostly in minority communities of color again. You say that you have tools that help you do this work citywide. The tools are great, but if you only use those tools in communities of color that are poor, then it doesn't matter if it's a, a tool that can be used citywide. You're not using it citywide. Um, it, it's a concern, and I don't even want you to answer that question. I kind of want to move to to the gentrification issue that we're having here and the displacement issue. It's the number one concern that communities have regarding um, uh, rezonings, displacement and gentrification. They want to fight against that. and. Bushwick is a rezoning that's happened that we're working on in my in my district that I that I'm very happy about the process that we've been able to create. And during a meeting, uh, one of you know, the director of Brooklyn made mention to something, and I'm just going to state what he said. He said our intention is to preserve the character and the buildings, not the people in them. So a, he said this at a community meeting in which folks are trying to fight 
to one, rezone it so they can preserve the character and their buildings, but also to preserve the people that have been there for the last 40, 50, 60 years, that were in Bushwick when it was burning, that were in Bushwick when the crime was high, that were in Bushwick when no one else wanted to be there, when the city abandoned them. But this person comes into this meeting, and I want to be clear, this is not a low-level staffer or an intern. This is the director of the Brooklyn office made this statement that he cared, that his goal is to preserve the character and the buildings, not the people living in them. And I want you to speak to me because that, that comes down to like the foundation by which your agency is operating in these rezonings. It speaks to what the concern is for residents in these poor communities, um, what they think your intention is, which is just build. Don't worry about the people, just build. S speak to me how this statement made by um, a director of our Brooklyn office um, is different from what you believe. And two, if it is, well, then why have folks in your office that speak against your, your goals or your principles? The director of the Brooklyn office misspoke and immediately apologized at the building. And council member, I apologize to you as well. That is not the approach most decidedly. We look at neighborhood character. Neighborhood character is defined by the buildings. It's defined by the parks. It's defined by the streets, by the retail strips, but it is also principally defined by the people. It is the people who make a neighborhood, and again, I apologize on behalf of the department. That is not our approach. That's, that, I'm glad you apologize, and I just want to say that when this happened, the community was fighting for about 30 more minutes asking for an apology, and it didn't happen. And then I, I believe the statement that happened afterwards was, uh, in the sake of moving this process forward, I will apologize is what happened. Um, my understanding I really, is different. I just really want to put it in perspective for my colleagues here that this is the director of the Brooklyn office, and if he is the person in charge of rezoning Brooklyn or assisting in the rezoning of Brooklyn, and he goes to sleep at night believing this, then we should all be very concerned because this is the real intention of the Brooklyn office. And I just, I don't think that anything has been addressed regarding this incident in the D, in DCP. It's almost like, can we throw, can we sweep this under the rug and move forward? And that is a concern. Council member, I would have to disagree with that okay. characterization. One, there was an apology at the meeting. Second, I was informed immediately afterwards. And three, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to say that is not our approach, and I apologize for that statement. That does not reflect how we view neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are made up of buildings, people, parks, stores, but mostly people. Well, I'm hoping that moving forward, we have folks that come into the community that abide by your principles. It would be very hard to see that director come back to Bushwick and be taken seriously. Um, and to be honest, I think we, we, we burned some bridges that didn't need to be burned in an effort to, to rezone. And then I want to talk about economic development. Uh, there's a, a North Brooklyn Industrial and Innovation Plan where DCP has been working for over three years to develop comprehensive reforms for manufacturing zoning that would allow both industrial and commercial businesses to grow. It is not mentioned in your testimony, um, but this is a very important initiative for economic development in the city and is part of both the Mayor's Industrial Action Plan and New York, and New York Works Plan. Uh, we also did an engine of opportunities uh, plan here in the city council and presented it. Uh, when we meet, it seems like for the most part, we are in alignment in regards to our goals um, when it comes to manufacturing and our industry. But then the, I recently received a plan after four and a half years of work, received a plan that speaks almost against everything we were discussing internally that were common grounds, I guess, between DCP and let's say the city council and myself. So I would love to know when that study is gonna be completed uh, after four years um, and, and whether or not you guys are taking it serious because at this point, uh, nothing sh uh, that study didn't need to take four years. What's interesting with respect to studies of this nature is again, some people say, why have they taken so long? Others will say, wait, we need more studies. Um, but I share your sense of impatience with respect to this. Um, for members of the council that might not be as aware, the North Brooklyn Industrial Study is the most in-depth planning study of industrial areas that the department has conducted in decades. Most of our zoning for industrial areas dates back to 1961. Um, the goal 
is to look at our manufacturing areas, areas that are zoned M in the city, and to look at how the zoning, how the land use aligns with today's reality. Certainly the nature of work has changed markedly. We're also, in particular, looking at industrial areas that are close to transit and that are close to office sectors. Don't think of the traditional offices in the financial district or in Midtown, but in the workplaces for some of the new TAMI economy, the, the technology-based economy, um, and looking at how heavy industry, light industry, and then this new economy office space can coexist. Um, we've produced a draft of the study. We do not want to release it until we have worked with the affected council members, in particular Council Member Reynoso, but also Council Member Levin, whose district encompasses this. We had had a meeting scheduled ahead of this, but unfortunately it didn't come to pass. We would welcome the opportunity to sit down with you. The reason I mention it for the benefit of the other council members is while the work looks very closely at North Brooklyn, we think that it can inform us as we look at other M-zoned areas that have good mass transit access. So we view it as a stepping stone, as um, a lens into possibly other areas of the city. But council member, we are looking forward to rescheduling with you at your convenience. Uh, so the reason that meeting was canceled is because I requested it be canceled. Because what you gave us as a draft was something that I believe was an insult to the work that we've been doing for the last four years, one. And two, uh, that there are rumblings that DCP has a better plan that it's holding on to in an effort to leverage against my Bushwick rezoning. I just want you to know that the, the, the level of trust that, that, it, that exists between my community and DCP is non-existent. You can't, you can't do a rezoning when the people don't trust each other. We can't do a good job, I guess, in a rezoning. We wanna to work together, we wanna to build together, and I really feel that DCP is falling short on its ability to, to, to build a, in, a, in a way that would make it, that would encourage other communities to want to go through this process. Um, so uh, I thank you for your time, and I hope that moving forward we can build a relationship that has some semblance of trust and faith, but at this moment, uh, you know, DCP has been an agency that's been extremely difficult and disheartening to work with. Council Member, I'd welcome the opportunity to work with you on either or both of those. I do think that not speaking and not meeting isn't, is not the most productive way forward, so I would hope that we would be able to sit down with you and forge a path forward. Thank you, Council Member Reynoso. Um, Madam Chair, as I'm sitting here, I'm getting text messages from my district managers from the different community boards. And they're telling me that they just feel that city planning does not listen to the community's input. Um, a perfect example, in my district, the Southern Boulevard study, um, city planning is trying to move forward on this project, but they only have 300 surveys. For a community that I represent over 170,000 people with this portion, only 300 surveys, and they want to move forward on this on the study. How can you move forward on a study with only 300 surveys? They need to do a better job. And the perception in the community is that there's a plan already in place. And, you know, and so city planning is coming here. They want to quote unquote work with us on this study, but a plan is already put in place. And city planning wants to tell us what we need in our communities. And it's frustrating. Council member, I um, share your frustration on the difficulty of getting responses to surveys, of getting community input. I think it's something that we share. I'll use the um, Jerome Avenue plan as an example. Um, there, we need to engage one over a period of time, and that's the purpose of conducting a study. We also need to engage in different ways. On the Jerome Avenue plan, um, we found that going out with a city planning table to community events, whether it was Boogie on the Boulevard, um, the local street fairs, and engaging people. We've recognized the challenge. People work hard during the day and so may not want to come to a community board meeting. Or in the Gowanus example, we had a number of weekend meetings hosted um, with a council member. But again, there is an element of self-selection. So any ideas for better ways to get a higher survey response? 
We know that in Gowanus, using an online portal was tremendously successful. It might not be as successful in other neighborhoods, but certainly is, it is a tool that we now have that we would be willing to deploy. Um, I'd also note again that a study is the beginning of a process. And so if the community board, if you council member have ideas for better engagement, absent leadership from a council member, the opportunity for a comprehensive neighborhood plan um, is markedly diminished. All right. So we have up next uh, Chair Kalos, followed by Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Richards. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, how, how are you holding up with the passing of Stephen Hawking? Council Member, it is, I am so glad that you mentioned that. I had the privilege, I, I studied physics at Cooper Union and many years ago and had the privilege of meeting Stephen Hawking and he is one of the geniuses of our time. Um, coupled with a wit, um, I think not only has he expanded the boundaries of science, but he has also, he was a living testament to the fact that disabilities are just different abilities. Uh, I, I never got to meet him. I've read all of his work, at least uh, the, for, for the general public. I haven't read his academic work as per se, but uh, thank you for bringing your science background to government. We need more of that. I also want to thank you for your partnership. Just to share with my colleague, uh, uh, Reynoso, I, I have uh, ha had protests about issues that were before Department of City Planning and uh, then had Department of City Planning meet with us the same day. Uh, and appreciate the commitment to having an ongoing dialogue where we've been able to get to resolution. Uh, I want to just touch on quick four items. Uh, in 2017, we were able, able to pass Local Law 101 relating to having a Board of Standards and Appeals Coordinator at DCP. Uh, and uh, you have complying to an extent by posting on a page on your large site called uh, mandatory mandated and other notices uh, that a person not the name but just their email and Vargas uh, has been assigned so if you could share that person's name and consider creating a dedicated board of standards and appeals uh, page uh, that would be helpful and even to explain to people what this agency that no one has ever heard of and is yet uh, more powerful than city planning. <laughs> um, I would be glad to share the person's name. Um, she is a member of our zoning division, Nicole Vargas. Um, I actually think that it is better not to put a particular person's name on a website because if the person happens to be away, the information would go to the BSA coordinator and whoever is covering while she was, is away will have access to the information. I, I Fair enough, and then also just also seeing where you've weighed in is also part of it, so that's the reason for pushing for that. Uh, I wanna just echo the comments of uh, the, the zoning chair and the land use chair uh, regarding urban planners and their importance. I think it's an important expertise, and I, I believe you would agree with me that receiving, the train, re receiving a training here and there uh, short of an academic credential just isn't quite the same. Inez Dickens uh, is one of my favorite council members, now assembly member. She had been setting aside expense funding, which I've now started to do as well. So we have an urban planner that we fund out of city council expense who doesn't work for city planning, but has a duty just to community board 11 and community board six now. Uh, he's created a cottage industry. His name's George James. His name is in the Times every other week, challenging something. And uh, I, I urge my colleagues to set aside expense funding for each of their community boards with their respective colleagues to hire urban planners to work just on that. But um, introduction 732, which we, we introduced last year and uh, heard and what have you, would say that each community board should have a dedicated urban planner or even have them pooled, but I think what you're hearing across the board uh, is that um, there isn't any, but there is no urban planner at each community board who is looking at every 
zoning or BSA application. And I believe you would agree that when there's an urban planner like George Janes or another going through, we're getting different results in the same situations. So I guess, would you be willing to either support the legislation when it's reintroduced or provide funding uh, or advocate for funding to actually give an urban planner dedicated to each community board where their client is the community board and they may end up opposing something that DCP or CPC is pushing or, or the mayor through ECF? Again, I would view that as a council prerogative, council member. <laughs> fair, fair enough, uh, but, but I, fair enough. Uh, in terms of your testimony, you talked about um, trying to limit parking, and what I can say is in a, th there's groups like Transportation Alternatives and, and Streets Pack, and full disclosure, they've endorsed me and many of the people here, and one of the thoughts that we're looking at in urban planning is actually taking back the streets and rethinking the streets and saying, should the streets belong to five people who need a place to park their car? Or should we have loading and unloading in every single new building? Should we have parking in every new building? And as the future is coming very quickly, and we're looking at a future where people might actually be able to share cars, actually requiring that there be parking in buildings so that people can go, and there's a lot of jurisdictions where when you need to shop at a store, you go there, you park at a garage, the store validates your parking, and we could actually take the space that, if you look back in our history, the streets belonged to the people. There were no cars on the streets. There were push carts. That's where Macy started. And so can we think about requiring parking and new construction, at least particularly in Manhattan, to, and, and pull the parking off the street and widen our, our common spaces? I'm glad you mentioned that, Council Member. Um, while I was in Washington, D.C., a much more car-dependent city, I very reluctantly purchased a car and was so pleased in returning to New York to be able to get rid of it and once again be car-free. Um, me you me too. <laughs> who needs one with a Metro card, right? Um, I, you raised lots of interesting ideas, and I think the key is going to be looking neighborhood by neighborhood because obviously the Manhattan core is very, very different from the south shore of Staten Island. When we look at parking, um, at possible changes to parking requirements, it is in the context of transit-rich neighborhoods. Um, some of the things that you mentioned are the type of long-term thinking that we are engaged in. Um, something that you didn't mention, but that I do think will change the future use of our streets are increasingly autonomous vehicles. And as you know, council member, it's not an on-off switch. Vehicles are becoming increasingly more autonomous. Um, I think these are all useful planning issues in which to engage, and I welcome your work on it. So I, I think along that in terms of planning, in the budget, is it possible to start breaking out by project? I was really pleased during the mayor's town hall while you talked about uh, looking at closing loopholes. In my district, we have a situation where there's density of 10, it's the maximum allowed under law, 12 with affordable housing. Uh, we haven't really closed the loopholes that allow people to build luxury housing in my, on the Upper East Side and then put the affordable housing component in Queens or in East Harlem. Uh, and uh, similarly, what we're seeing is that building that's 10 FAR that would normally be 20 stories tall and 210 feet, we, saw, we, we every, every day that goes by, we get another release from another developer that's figured out a way to make their building. The newest one is 370 feet tall uh, in, in where all the buildings surrounding it are under 200 feet. And uh, it, it, those are going to be ultra luxury units that I don't know anyone who can afford to live there. And I appreciate a commitment to trying to close the loopholes that allow people to get much taller. And I'm okay with height if it was 37 stories of affordable housing, but it's I don't know how many stories of ultra luxury. So what is the timeline and how much funding do you have so that you can keep up with development? And I know that you prefer not to uh, respond to existing projects, but when you made your announcement in January, these projects hadn't been announced yet and would love to get this done before another 20 projects are built. 
Thank you for the question, Council Member. It's something that you and I have discussed on a number of occasions, and I welcome the fact that you've brought a focus to this issue. Um, I would disagree with the characterization of this as a loophole. I think what has happened is that as building technologies have changed, the economics of construction have also changed, and we have found a number of proposed buildings that have surprised communities with respect to the shape of them. And as I committed, as the mayor committed at the town hall, this issue of its, um, in the shorthand called excessive voids, is something that we are working with, uh, with other agencies to address. But I think we need to be clear that the issue is one where we need to take a long, hard look because there are so-called voids that we absolutely celebrate. We need to go no further than the municipal building with the soaring entryway. And so we know that our city deserves great architecture. We know that we've seen results that weren't anticipated. And so I will reiterate the commitment that we anticipate by the end of the year being able to have a nuanced approach to address the so-called excessive voids. I appreciate the end of the year. If it could be sooner, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. Uh, now we'll hear from Chair Adams. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Thank you, Chair Lago, for being here. Thank your team for being here as well. Just to revisit a couple of items that my colleagues have brought um, very eloquently to the table. Um, I know that you're not HPD, but because of your partnership with HPD, do you have any ideas about what can be done to improve the inequality found using AMI as the income standard for affordable housing? On that, I'm afraid I will have to defer to the experts at HPD, and um, I'm glad that you mentioned the partnership. Um, it, we are pleased by how well our teams work together. Okay, thank you very much. Um, getting back to the grassroots um, education piece here, I'm a former chairperson of Community Board 12 Queens. That's the second largest community board in the borough. And I, I'm just really, really interested to go back to what Chair Moya uh, spoke about as well as uh, Chair Reynoso, and that is the involvement at the grassroots level of the community boards being the first line of governance to our city agencies. Um, I'm very concerned because um, in, in my work with the community board since 2009, I've never really seen or participated in any training with city planning. Um, I don't know if that has gone through the Land Use Committee at Board 12. I don't think so, because that was never facilitated to the full board, to all of the members. So I'm just curious to know how the process of training uh, occurs. Is it uh, something that happens on a yearly basis? Is it something that's facilitated via the borough presidents? Is it something that's taken directly to the committee chairs on the boards? Because personally, again, I have not seen that involvement intricately within Community Board 12. So, um, you know, as you were well aware, the Community Board members are nominated by the elected officials, the borough presidents, and the local council members. On a yearly basis, the new, counts, new representatives on the Community Boards, as they are brought on board, we are often asked by the borough presidents to come facilitate those meetings. I've been a director of the Bronx and the Brooklyn offices both, and I have done personally some of those sessions uh, in my time there. Um, those are meetings where who attends is not our call, um, you know, but we are part of, of the team that is talking to them about land use issues in particular, and I'm assuming they, they are given training in other aspects of their roles as well. Um, in addition to that, any community board that has asked us to come talk to them on any issue, we are always ready. And, you know, our boroughs are there as the first line, and they are very responsive to any request for any kind of, um, of training. So are you confirming then that this training has indeed taken place in the borough of Queens? I am not. I can get back to you on that. Okay, the thank other you. thing, council member, is we would welcome requests from any council member on behalf of a community board. Should I treat your request as 
a training request for a CB12? Oh, yes. <laughs> Will do. Thank you. As, as well as I'm sure that my colleague, um, Chair Moya, would agree with me also for his community boards as well. Thank you so much. So actually, I can confirm for you that the Queen's training did take place. Council Member Adams. We can confirm that a Queen's training did take place. Last April. Okay, last April at, at uh, with the borough president. Okay, was at that Borough the, Hall. Generally, borough it's Hall. at Borough Hall. Yeah. Yes. Was that the? Do you know if that was the only training that's taken place in the past? Perhaps I think this is a yearly training. I'm, I'm speaking about in Queens specifically, though. Uh, I mean, the other thing I'll add is before with the recent release of the community district needs statements, we've sat down with all 15, or maybe offered to 59 district managers and land use chair or land use chairs or whoever the board wants to promote to sort of get through the training on how to use the new form and in the process learn more about the city and the things that they can request from the city. And that's been done in all five boroughs. I would say we've talked to 57 district managers to make sure they're familiar with the form and the new land use chairs as well. All right, so my recommendation to the community boards, specifically to my community board, will be to have uh, an in-house training with city planning instead of uh, primarily going through uh, the borough president's offices, just to make sure that all of the membership is educated um, as far as uh, city planning and city planning regulations and methods, you love all of that is concerned. Thank you. Uh, Inez Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to all the chairs that are here from the committees and to the panel that's here as well. Um, I didn't get a specific number. Did I miss it or did you not have an answer as to the number of blacks who are a part of your department? I heard you say 53% white and 47% non-white, but did you give us a number as to how many are Black. We'll be glad to provide that in just a moment. Okay. And then while he's looking that up, um, I wanted to uh, echo the comments of my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Moyer, Councilmember Salamanca, in terms of looking at the issue of gentrification. The federal government, when it first uh, supported the call for development of residences, along the transit-rich zones, in its document stated that this oftentimes results in gentrification and displacement of those who are there. Uh, and while I'm on that, you said, my colleague Reynoso said that the Brooklyn Deputy Director in his statements, in his statement talked about not being concerned about maintaining the people who presently live there. Um, is he still the Brooklyn director? Yes. Uh, what consequences or what training or what happened to him for him having made that statement, which I hear now extended for 30 minutes or so? Again, the statement did not extend for 30 minutes. The discussion in the community reaction may have extended. I will note that, one, he apologized at the meeting, informed me immediately, and I, again, am apologizing on behalf of the department. That is not our view. That is not our policy. So was any kind of entry or any kind of training given to him? Because obviously his mindset has him think that that's okay. So was any kind of training offered to him or in a kind, any kind of uh, cultural sensitivity? I'll note that he immediately realized that he misspoke and apologized on the hey, spot. Well, that's not what my colleague said, which is why I offered that question. Uh, but in terms of displacement, the East New York rezoning was the first model that came. And I heard the uh, Chair, Chair Salamanca, say that in his community, people were very concerned because their input was not reflected. And that was, in fact, also the case with the East New York rezoning. The community said that it wanted to see more provisions for low-income housing. That was never reflected in the documents. The community board rejected it. Uh, I had a little piece of the 96 blocks, I think maybe six blocks, and I did not support it. The borough president did not support it, but it did come forward, and my colleagues 
voted it in, so it is policy. But the community said that it wanted to see more appropriation of apartments and units to better match the AMIs, which one of my colleagues also talked about, of the community. Specifically, 53% of Community Board 5 has an income of less than $35,000. And only 17% has an income of $75,000 or greater. So that's what exists. 53% at 35, 17% at 75. The plan only allows for 12% at 35 and brings in 55% at 75. It's almost a total reversal of what presently exists. So do you think that, that in fact is a form of gentrification or contributes to gentrification? when it's a total flip from 53% presently there providing for only 12% at that income ban and where you have 17% now moving to 55%. Uh, council member, the rezoning in East New York, which was approved by the council with support from the council, yes. um, does not specify income bans. Income bans are specified on a project by project basis. We share- The, the report that was printed has percentages. That's where I got the figures from. I didn't make them up. We prepare an environmental impact statement, which yes. is a disclosure document. The actual housing that will be developed is very much driven by the market. In East New York, currently market rate housing doesn't pencil out, and so the development that we're seeing is further subsidized by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and that gives the opportunity to drive even deeper levels of affordability. Also, as I've, um, as I've mentioned, when there is city-owned land, that gives us the opportunity to apply even more tools to make housing on city-owned land affordable to a lower AMI level. Again, the figures that I quoted are what's in the printed document, so I didn't make them up, they didn't come out of the air. So I would request that you do some further investigation. I can perhaps share those with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Landers, followed by Council Member Richards and Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, we've been going on a while. And, uh, but I, I, I appreciate, first, I appreciate the energy that the Brooklyn staff and the resources that you guys have put into the Gowanus process. And you've uh, mentioned it a few times here. And I really agree. It has been uh, really encouraging to watch lots of people come out and get involved. We've worked hard. It is indeed um, a higher income and wider neighborhood than many of the others, but it, there's public housing residents and we've worked hard to make it an inclusive process. Your team has done uh, a really good job of it and we still have a long way to go there, but I think we are poised okay. for uh, a rezoning process. Look, no one is, is like jumping up and down about the prospects of, you know, high-rise residential development at heights taller than the surrounding brownstone neighborhoods. That's not going on a poster that people are going to be marching with the streets, through the streets with anytime soon. But the process that we have organized together has moved a lot of people to see the possibilities of a comprehensive rezoning and a set of investments that will make the neighborhood stronger and more inclusive. And I do think in response to what a few of my colleagues have said about the challenges and fears of gentrification, being in a neighborhood where there's going to be less displacement because there are fewer low-income people um, in privately owned housing, it means this is an opportunity we should be taking in other higher income neighborhoods around the city. And I hope Gowanus will not be a one-off, but will be a model for both in the forms of planning and in, in doing this work in, in neighborhoods. There's still gonna be resistance, even if it's not built around gentrification and displacement, um, but that's work that we have to do together. So I guess just all I wanna ask about is given some of what we've heard uh, today about the desire for more engagement, about some of the 
Um, it does seem to me it's worth really reflecting on what's been working and not working, what we learned from what we're doing in Gowanus, what we're learning from the other neighborhoods, and just elevating um, our collective game, city planning's for sure, but all of ours, in how we do engagement on these hard issues, what we've learned, and how we're going to move forward to do it productively. So I just wonder what you guys are doing internally across five borough offices um, to take a set of people who, yes, are all professionals, but who all, all of us, uh, could be learning from what's working and what's not working and how we do this work better. And I just wonder if you could reflect on how you guys are thinking about doing that. And maybe it's something we could partner on. There's clearly a lot of appetite from my colleagues uh, to figure out how we, how we do this work more effectively. Thank you, council member. And I certainly hope that other council members in higher income districts will follow your lead, seeing the productive work that is occurring in Gowanus. I think when we look at the rezonings initiatives or the comprehensive neighborhood plans that are underway, those that have been approved, and I'll put Jerome, those that are in the making, um, there are a couple of threads of good lessons learned. It starts with the council members' leadership. That is an absolute indispensable um, factor. Um, I think the other is looking for ways to engage people where they live and where they work. And I think that um, we had that extensively in Jerome, going out to the neighborhoods, uh, taking advantage of other events, not city planning or council member sp sponsored events, but neighborhood events and making ourselves available there. Um, one of the tools that we use is not just our neighborhood planners, but our urban designers. We have an urban design team that can take input from a community about how they want their community to look and feel and sketch it into a drawing. And for those who don't speak the language of our six, our eight zoning, seeing a sketch, people who um, might not immediately understand what improvements to the public realm mean, seeing a sketch of a neighborhood boulevard with trees, with dividers, helps bring um, the community's wishes to a, a, a visual, visual, a more tangible form. Um, I think another key, and I'll particularly note the Jerome Avenue um, initiative, was reaching out, identifying and reaching out to neighborhood anchors. What are the institutions that are major employers and that have a vested interest in the community. Um, I spent so much time in the Bronx in addition to the planning team meeting with the heads of these anchor institutions who weren't going to move, who were going to stay there and so wanted to see the neighborhood thrive. Reaching out to major nonprofits who again have a stake in the, in, um, in the neighborhood. They are in addition to grassroots organizations part of the fabric of the community. And um, I think the final is recognizing that every neighborhood is different. The issues that we are confronted and we're able to address in the Jerome Avenue corridor are very different from the Gowanus mix that people speak about wanting to preserve in your neighborhood. So I don't think while we can learn lessons, we should never bring a cookie cutter approach. And I'll just add, so I appreciate all of that. I agree with almost all of it. The only thing I'm going to disagree with is the thing that you said at the very beginning about, and I appreciate your coming before the council and saying it's got to be led by council member leadership, but we're not going to meet fair housing goals for this city. We're not going to honestly confront segregation if we are 100% deferential to those communities that don't want any additional development. Um, and I don't really think it's true that like the people of East New York or the people of East Harlem or the people of Jerome Avenue were jumping up and down saying bring growth. Rockaway was a little bit different given underinvestment. So I just, I'm glad that HPD launched the fair housing process despite the rollback of the Carson HUD. But, but we have a collective obligation to do this in a way that honors fair share principles. 
and we can't just let kind of the door be closed. So that's a conversation for another day, but um, I think it's been reinforced by what a lot of folks are saying here. I like think we can show in Gowanus that you can make it work, but we can't wait for people to be convinced before we start if we want to do this in a way that is truly equitable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you, um, Councilmember Lander. Uh, we'll have Councilmember Richards and then Rivera. All right, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chairs. And uh, certainly I want to start by thanking you uh, for the work that we did in Far Rockaway. And I think Brad just alluded to it, Far Rockaway was a different beast. But it does come down to leadership, and that's without a doubt. You know, and um, I'm not tooting my own horn by any means, but, um, you know, I, I just want to start off with a comment. Please, at least when you think of my district, while I respect the community boards and I appoint people, by any means they do not speak for the larger community. So I will put it on the record for my community board, no one else has to agree. Um, but for my board, you know, we want to have a larger uh, conversation with the larger community when it comes to planning because as you saw there's a disconnect and depending on how diverse the community board is there can be a difference of opinion a good instance of that is on affordability there were those on one part of the community board who felt that we should do nothing but a hundred or more higher AMI and my contention was that's not going to happen so just want to put that out there that you know, community boards don't speak for everyone sometimes. Uh, and we need to diversify community boards and we need term limits on community boards as well. Um, just in terms of community engagement, and I think you largely got it right in Rockaway. I mean, I, I've never seen the level of engagement with city planning. Probably I haven't heard of anyone else who, you've gone to people's kitchen tables. So I think largely this was a great model. Um, I do think that we have to figure a way to engage communities way in advance. And I think you did it right there, but we're a model. And I think one way of doing that is to create a community engagement unit within city planning. And I'm not sure if you've given thought to this. Um, I will float, we're looking at some legislation possibly, but it is something that I think you're going to have to really seriously entertain. And one, um, you know, the other question is how are we retaining and how are we doing outreach um, to ensure there are more planners of color coming into city planning who are representative of the very communities that it seems to be a lot of city on, on land is at, right? And we know for a lot of the communities you're looking at, like a Far Rockaway, these are largely communities that have a lot of city land, you know, a lot of disinvestment, so therefore you're moving in a, in a certain direction. Um, so I want to hear your thoughts on that. And then lastly, uh, well, I'll just touch in, I think Brad alluded to this too, just on fair housing. Um, you know, we're going to have to be bold. And, and, and I know that we, we like to, having support is important when it comes to projects. And I know the city moves, likes to, be in a place where, you know, the, the press perhaps is not attacking you every second and, and, you know, we want flowers and green grass. But you are going to have to make tough decisions. And, and that comes with leadership within a department. It comes from leadership within the mayor's office. And, you know, if, if you're looking for every project, at least in terms of trying to create fair housing, if you're looking for everyone to sing kumbaya on every project, you'll never get to the levels of affordability in different communities. Uh, and, and we need to also continue to encourage our colleagues to do that, to take some ownership like Brad as well. My last question is flood resiliency tax. Um, when can we anticipate that coming online? Um, you know, obviously we're seeing more nor'easters and other things happening, and we need to really uh, move fast um, in terms of climate change. So those are, those are my questions at Community Engagement Unit. Um, I mentioned Community Board, Flood Resiliency Tax, and your, and your thoughts on moving tougher. Certainly. Um, you said that you wouldn't toot your own horn, but if I could toot your horn, the 
I, 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 okay, I won't member, stop you. Um, <laughs> council Member Lander disagrees with me, but I do think that it is Council Member leadership first and foremost, and that is what was key to the rezoning in downtown Far Rockaway. And as you said, in a neighborhood where the demographics had changed since the last time we looked at the um, at the zoning. Um, with respect, you one of your questions was with respect to retaining and outreach to minority planners, and that is something that we are keenly focused on. I had mentioned before the um, the fact that we have summer internships that are paid and that are focused on developing a diverse pipeline. The other is by expanding the reach of the schools that we look at. Obviously, we hire people who are trained as planners, but they don't have to come from only a small number of schools. And we are so fortunate that we have in the city Hunter, which has an excellent urban planning program. We have Rutgers, which has a strong program. These are more urban schools and we'll have, we're, we face the challenge that the planning profession overall doesn't reflect the demographics of the city, but that means we need to make the extra effort and to go beyond the usual suspect schools. Um, and not just schools. Is there a way you can create a program and you know within city planning? Is there something you can be doing internally, a fellowship? I don't know what it looks like, but something that would really um, do that. I don't think we should just look for schools. I think we need to. We, and we yeah. are doing that, Council Member. Uh, I think um, what starts to happen is we've attracted some very um, strong minority planners, and we are really using them now to go out to American Planning Association, American Institute of Architects, and to the schools, to job fairs when those are held, and their cohorts to start helping us in building a network. We are creating within city planning diversity groups that allow our planners to present their own uh, point of view on some of the hiring decisions, on some of the ways of increasing diversity. We are very, very focused on this issue. We are also partnering actually with schools before to, to help them recruit more minority candidates into the schools themselves. And um, the, the summer training program, the sum, uh, we, we don't do just uh, internships. We have created a land use academy where we introduce them to you know, planning. Some of them are coming to us not yet sure if they would pursue planning as they look at graduate schools. So we are trying our best. After they look at the rezoning and planning, okay. <laughs> we, they do, they do come to your meetings. And, and that actually often very like, Do helpful. I wanna get yelled at? <laughs> we are open to listening to other thoughts that you or your colleagues might have, but this is something we feel very strongly about and we want to do as now, much. Now, do you have a goal in mind? Is there a percentage goal that you're thinking about? Because you should probably start there, like 30% more by, I don't know, the mayor comes up with all of these goals, right? So could we think about that within the department, you know, perhaps getting to a 30% workforce where, you know, or more, you know, I don't want to say 30, but 50, whatever it is. Um, I certainly would want to be and, aggressive And probably it. should think about that. Um, continuing with a number of the other items that you've mentioned, um, we are so pleased that HPD, that the administration decided to go ahead with the fair housing analysis despite the rollback in Washington. Um, the I'm sorry, and you didn't answer my question, community engagement unit. Okay, got it, okay. <laughs> I have a star next to that one, saving the best till last. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't need to rush it. We can just get straight to the point here because um, we have one more oh, council certainly. member and I have another hearing and then I have to be out of here by 2 p.m. Okay, Thank you. just sorry. trying to address the multi-part question and I'll be quick about it. With respect to um, expecting flowers and green grass and roses thrown at us for our rezonings, we know that that is not a reality, but we also know that absent council member support, it makes it incredibly difficult to get a rezoning done. And so again, welcome the fact that so many members of the council are focused on getting a broader array of council members to ask us for rezonings. With respect to the flood resiliency text, um, we have conducted an unprecedented amount of outreach early on, and we anticipate that later this year, 
we can actually begin the more formal engagement, and so we will be re-engaging. We recognize that while the federal government may have delayed on preparing the revised flood zone maps, Mother Nature doesn't follow the federal government's time frame, and we need to put in place these protections. And then finally, uh, Ms. Kapur will address the issue of the community engagement unit. So um, we recognize the need to engage with communities in, in a meaningful and a ground up way, you know, from the get go. We have been learning as we have been doing these, you know, three, four, five rezonings now. And um, we are, we recently hired someone to be our community engagement person who is going to work across the five boroughs in dealing with lessons learned where our engagement has been successful, where we've met, uh, you know, faced challenges, what have been the best strategies that we've identified. And this is someone who comes to us from Boston, has been involved with contentious community building exercises and, and getting, you know, consensus, consensus, consensus on, uh, on these kinds of challenging. Uh, I, I, would I was talking about a unit, but a person is a good start. No, a, a couple of things. One, this is a very senior hire. It reports directly to Ms. Kapoor. Second, I had had the um, advantage years of, ago of working at the Boston Redevelopment Authority and seeing that they had first-rate staff. We rated one of their best who had headed their community engagement unit. And this person has the authority to work with the frontline planners and make sure that there is consistency borough to borough in the depth of and the meaningfulness of the engagement. Well, thank you. I want to thank you, Chair. And I'm just sad we got another Red Sox fan coming into New York City government. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we look forward to uh, meeting this person and working with them and sure. broadening it out a little bit more. So thank you. I'd also note that she is a diverse candidate. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Richards. Um, I'm sorry, uh, um, Council Member um, Rivera. So I will, I, I had a couple of questions, but I'm just gonna stick to one for time. And this has to do with uh, commercial zoning. And I know there are a lot of challenges and changes that have come to our community. So we're all trying to think a little bit more creatively on how we help small businesses survive and thrive in New York City. So we've heard from stakeholders in numerous communities, including our community boards, of which I am from a community board, and I spent time on the Economic Development Committee talking on talking about updating commercial overlay zoning and how we feel it would be helpful encouraging the growth of small businesses. So DCP, unfortunately, you seem to lack sufficient resources to fully engage with communities on commercial corridor zoning issues, like expanding commercial overlays and establishing more special enhanced commercial districts. So my question, are there any plans to devote additional resources to this issue? And if not, would it make more sense to have SBS take a more active role on commercial corridor zoning issues? Thank you for the question, and in particular recognizing the um, vitality and the commercial mixed nature of your district where we see commercial, institutional, community facility and residential units cheek by jowl. We work hand in glove with the Department of Small Business Services. It's interesting at the various mayoral town halls, how frequently Commissioner Greg Bishop and I are both standing up to um, be by the mayor's side as he addresses these questions. So they are absolutely indispensable partners. Um, with respect to the special enhanced districts, those are by nature going to have to be tailored on a community by community basis. We don't see that the approach that was taken for the Upper West Side, for instance, would be appropriate on a citywide basis. Ms. Kapoor, would you want to elaborate? Um, I mean, I would just say that we would be happy to sit down with you on your particular concerns if there are corridors that you would like us to review more carefully. We are engaged in a citywide sort of overall jobs plan issue, and this is a part of that, but we'd be more than happy to discuss any particular corridors that you might want to discuss. So sure, I was on my community board as far back as 2011, and we were speaking on this exact thing back in back then. Okay. So they've had a number of meetings, they've, they've brought the council in to make a presentation, and so this conversation has been ongoing, and so 
I hope that you have some information on Community Board 3 and what they'd like to do to encourage small business growth in the area. If not, that's disappointing, but I'm happy to connect you and talk to you a little bit more about it. Lovely. Okay. Great. I would like to thank you for your testimony. Um, and uh, we will be sending out a letter with more questions uh, to see how we can follow up on some of our questions that needed some follow-ups. All right. Uh, so we're going to take a, a recess. Uh, and up next will be Do It. Thank you. So this hearing will be closed and a new hearing, uh, a budget hearing with we'll Do It Work commence after.